Talk Recorded live. Hello, everybody, and those who uh, will be listening to us in the future. I'd uh, like to welcome you to another episode of Nothing But the Truth. And once again, we're fortunate having uh, the org from Juggler 66 on. And uh, we're going to do some more reading from um, the article from remnantofgod.org and the, the characteristics of the Antichrist. Um, but first, I'm going to read a little bit of the headlines from Yahoo. My reason for that is, once again, is that um, it's a reflection of the times and who is running the media, uh, at least in my neck of the woods. And we'll start out with the just the headlines. Uh, the, fourth, the third, fourth headline is how... Uh, the Pope helped end the Cuban, uh, Cuba embargo. As more details emerge about the watershed normaliz- normalizing of di- diplomatic relations between the United States and Cuba, we'll learn more about the instrumental role that the Pope, that Pope, Prance, the Pope Francis played. And you can read more about that. That is the um, Atlantic... And let's see. Looks like a couple of them have been moved on me since the last time I looked. Um, here's Washington Post. Did historical Jesus really exist? The evidence just doesn't add up. Right. Um, oh, we're going at it again from the, the Jesuit train, Knights of Malta. Bill Clinton, picture of Bill Clinton with a young blonde goes viral. Uh, Article 7, I believe it is. Uh, Soul search. Why Pope Francis is barking up the wrong tree. Huffington Post. And is it Article 10? Uh, Vatican offers olive leaf branch to U.S. nuns. The Vatican City AP, Associated Press, a sweeping Vatican investigation into Roman Catholic nuns in the U.S. that began amid fears that they had become too feminist and secular ends up praising the sisters and their selfless work. Okay. Let's see. Wow. This is Article 12. Robio attacks... Pope for helping broke, broker Cuba deal. So if you notice, there's a lot of things this day about Cuba and the Vatican's role in it. Um, let's see. Of course, some more stuff about Israel. Let's see if I find one more thing about the uh, and then the Pope or the Vatican, and then I'll end it. And um, there's still were a lot more earlier today, but things have just shifted. And it looks like all the rest of them are about the Pope and the Cuba. Cuba is the big issue of the day, and the Pope's involvement. So my point in that, once again, Yahoo.com. A lot of folks feel that Yahoo means taking the mick out of us or that it's something even worse. That is uh, mocking our heavenly father. Dot com. I'm strongly getting the impression that dot com stands for Catholics own the media. Now with that, I'm done with my opinion, and I'm done with uh, reading the articles. We'll we'll start out with Jorg. Jorg, how you doing, man? I'm quite fine. Thank you for inviting me again for another episode on uh, Jabla. I don't know, uh, how you call it, Conversation with Juggler 66, which is uh, the name of my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, for people who want to know me, my real name is Jörg. That was, uh, by the way, the same name that and then Elias that Luther used when he was uh, hiding at the Wartburg to translate the Bible. He calls himself there Junker Jörg. Mm-hmm. That's exactly the same name. I find that quite funny. 
So I hope there won't be too many interrupting noises with, with my headset here because, uh, yeah, you know, when I, when I move my head, the cable makes some noise and it's sometimes interrupting. And I apologize for that, but as I do not have that much money to buy every week a new headset, even this one is really, uh, well, quite broken <laughs> for the moment. <laughs> uh, it still has to work for a moment. So uh, last week I introduced to you a new topic that I wanted to talk to you about that comes from the website www.remnantofgod.org from Nicholas, um, which has been praised by Tom Fress, who was on the broadcast last week, and also by me. I don't know if I did that, but I absolutely agree with what Tom Fress said in that regard. Uh, at least one of the most, if not the best website that you can find on the internet if you're doing uh, biblical historical research when you want to identify not only the Antichrist, but when you want to identify the times that we are living, when you want to study church and Christian history, when you want to expose false prophets, false churches, also like the FDA church. There are very, very long articles and uh, links on that website on that, how you can see that even the Seventh-day Adventist church has been infiltrated by the Jesuits and there are videos on there where this church even invites a Catholic priest into their, uh, uh, into their sermon to, to do a speech there. I mean, what more proof do you need that they have become apostate? So when you want to study these things and other things, then I can really advise you to go to that web page, a website. And from that website, I took a page that was uh, called Characteristics of Antichrist where Nicholas did the work to take 26 different uh, points where the Bible, the Word of God, explicitly identifies who the Antichrist is. I came to that idea because uh, some time ago I followed a book reading from Tom Fress on another talk show broadcast, and that was made by Walt Stickle, where he read the book Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Gritton Guinness that was written in 1887. And that book actually is a, it's not just a book that is written, but it's actually a collection of different, um, uh, how do you say that, uh, of different public appearances that Henry and Gutenberg did, and he did lectures in public. And three or four different of these lectures, he just put them together in a book and that he called Romanism and the Reformation. And um, in my humble opinion, next to the Bible, this is the book that every Bible-believing Christian, every Jesus-following person who calls himself this, at least in this world, and really means it, should read. Because when you do not know your adversary, by the way, another word for adversary is Satan. If you do not know your adversary, you do not know where you stand. And there's so much deception out there in the world about the Antichrist. Like when you go to Hollywood, for example, then you have all these movies, starting with in the 70s, The Omen, Rosemary's Baby, and I don't know what other movies I can all call, and then movies like The Exorcist, but they does have nothing to do with the Antichrist, but uh, movies like The Omen, for example, that absolutely deal with the Antichrist. Um, and this is all due to uh, Louis Alcazar and uh, Ribeiro, the two Jesuit priests who started in 1590 the Jesuit Futurist Agenda. And that Futurist Agenda was the work of the Roman Catholic Church to try to take the focus off itself. Because the focus has been on the Roman Catholic Church as being the Antichrist since the early 1520s. And all the reformers, in, uh, including Luther and the time of Luther, like Wycliffe, who was also living at the time still, all these reformers, maybe here and there, had some discrepancies, but they agreed on one thing. And the one thing that they absolutely agreed on was to identify the papacy, not the Pope, but the papacy, as a succession of people, as a. As a how do you call that? Uh, for that for succession for um, the dynasty, the dynasty of 
Antipopes, every Pope that has ever ruled in this world is an Antichrist. And it can be proven that this cannot be proven by men, but this is proven by God. This is proven by the Word of God. This is proven when you read and understand the prophecies of Daniel, and when you read and understand the prophecies of the Revelator in the Revelations. So, this book, Romanism and the Reformation, dealt all the time, not only with the identification of the Antichrist, but also with the whole church history from the first seven churches and uh, the ways of um, the ways of the papacy, of the rise of the papacy through the Inquisition. And uh, very interesting points were made there what happened in the Inquisition or what people saw in the Spanish Inquisition, which has not only been Spanish, but was all the uh, Suddenly, it wasn't strange. Um, and this book then gave me the idea of the article, the characteristics of the Antichrist, to because you know the book has more than 300 pages, to bring it a little bit more compressed to the people. Anyway, if you're interested in the lecture of Oldest uh, of the Regret Units, first of all, you can download the book uh, as a PDF from the internet. Second of all, you can buy the book uh, for, I think it's about 11 February reserve notes, or what you call dollars, um, online, on Amazon or whatever. You can get that book there. And uh, I, on my channel, Jotna66, have at least two or three videos that promote the reading of it, and in the description box you will find the links that lead you to the download of the PDF of the book on the one hand, and that lead you to the reading of Tom Fress on the other hand. And on my second channel, Jogler's War on Disinfo, I have all 28 parts of the reading of Tom Fress uploaded as video. So there's no excuse for you when you say, I don't know who the Antichrist is. Well, the information is out there, and the links are given to you, so you have just to study it for yourself. So that's the reason why I came after this page from, from Nicholas, uh, Characteristics of Antichrist, because there are 26, quote, short, unquote, <laughs> points where you will learn how the Bible identifies the Antichrist through the revelations of Daniel and through the revelations of John the Revelator. And last week we have started reading this part and... Uh, we were helped in the discussion um, that came along with that, or by a, not, not, not saying not a discussion, but by a further or deeper interpretation of the points that uh, Nicholas mentioned in this web page, uh, by Tom Press, who I'm sorry to say will not join us today, it seems, and uh, by Wayne Michael, who is also not here to join us today, so you will have to just deal with me and uh, Michael, but I guess that's all right. If you know, follow the series, you know us already. So, thank you very much for joining us tonight again. And uh, if you're not joining us, if you're downloading later, then thank you very much for doing the effort to go to the page of Talk Show and Nothing But the Truth of uh, Michael Adams and listen to this broadcast and the other broadcasts, which really we work very hard on, will bring you nothing but the truth. So, we have <clears throat> discussed the first five points, or the first five characteristics of the Antichrist last week, and I'm now going to start with the sixth point. Uh, it's a very interesting remark that I have to make in the beginning of this, because when you go to the web page, and you want to read this for yourself, what I'm reading here right now, um, then you will see that this point six has been updated. And also, this 26 characteristics of Antichrist, uh, Nicholas was so uh, was nice to put that in the PDF file that you can download on the internet too, and I did that. So we have, first of all, the PDF where this point six now is explained, but it is updated online, and by that that means that you also have a, a different explanation of that point that's been updated on the site, and I will read, sorry, I will read both to you, starting with the uh, original. Sorry, I had a hiccup right now, and that's uh, my um, I will start with the reading of the original PDF document uh, of characteristic number six, how to identify the Antichrist. And that starts with, um, uh, or the title of that is, after the 1260 years, the beast will be mortally wounded. 
to understand that, of course, you have to read uh, Revelation chapter 13. And um, it could, of course, be interesting to go into all of Revelation 13 and analyze that, but that alone is at least one broadcast, so I will not do that. But uh, we will just cite uh, a few points um, that uh, Nicholas mentions here and go through that. But Revelation 13 is a very interesting and very, very important revelation because also for all our listeners over there in the United States of America, Revelation 13 identifies uh, the place of America in the Bible. So, the title was, After 1260 Years, the Beast Will Be Mortally Wounded. The 1260 years that are referred to here are the 1260 years that we spoke of last week in our broadcast. That is the time from when the papacy came to full power in uh, 538 until the uh, capture of the Pope that we will deal with right now in 1798. This is uh, 1260 years. That is uh, 42 biblical months. Or that is time, times, and a dividing of time, as it is called in the Bible. But that we spoke about last week, so just... Go to the broadcast that we did last week, Conversation with Juggler 66, number 9, and uh, then you will have that. Now I'm going to continue with characteristic number 6 and uh, start quoting Revelation 13, verse 3. Quote, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. End quote. And Revelation 13, verse 10, reads, quote, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. The prophecy, uh, end quote, the prophecy is telling us that the beast would be destroyed with the sword. The sword is a military in this instance. At the end of its reign of exactly uh, 1,260 years of killing Christians. We just learned, by characteristic number five, by the previous prophecy, that this did in fact occur. But to further illustrate the fact that the prophecy also said the beast must go into captivity and die there, we find that history does tell us that the Pope was removed from the Vatican, was placed in exile, and then died. Pope dies, August 1799. Fact. Documented Roman Catholic sources states, quote, half Europe thought that with the Pope, the papacy was dead, end quote. Joseph Rickaby, the modern papacy, lectures of the history of religion, lecture 24. That is from the London Catholic Truth Society, 1910, page 1. Just a little remark from myself when I read a uh, a source that states it comes from the London, London Catholic Truth Society. I can't help but have a smile on my face. The word Catholic and Truth, quite uh, uh, a little strange to hear these two in one sentence together, right? <laughs> Ironic. Eh? <laughs> Ironic, yeah. So, but again, this happened exactly 42 prophetic months or 1,260 years, or a time and times, and dividing a time, after the papacy began its powerful reign as a, quote, woman on a beast, unquote, that the Pope did finally, quote, go into captivity, unquote, by the military of that day, and later did die, and did in fact die because of the actions brought forth by the, quote, sword, unquote, or military strength of Napoleon. This is what is being said on this part on the original uh, page that Nicholas wrote. And now I'm going to read to you the updated 1260 years the beast will be mortally wounded. Uh, Revelation 13.3 and 13.10 are mentioned also, but then it uh, goes on to say, prophecy is telling us that the beast would be destroyed with a sword at the end of the reign of exactly 1260 years of killing Christians. So that's still the same uh, I read here. 
We just learned from the previous prophecy that this, in fact, did occur. But to further illustrate the fact, the prophecy also said the beast must go into captivity and die there. We find that history does tell us that the Pope was removed from the Vatican, was placed in exile, and then did die. Um, well, now I read it, and I don't see any difference uh, of that one that I, that I just read before. So uh, We can finish this point six here. Uh, maybe... Michael, uh, you and I can discuss this a little bit. Uh, okay. To further explain to our listeners what exactly happened here, why it happened. Do you want to start, or shall I throw in? Uh, well, go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, when you read this and you understand that General Berthier, who was a general serving under Napoleon, was the one who was sent to Rome to arrest the Pope to end, at that moment, the civil power that the Pope had on the earth, because he has the two keys. He has the civil, or also called temporal, and the spiritual power over the known world at that time. What is interesting is that you have to know that, first of all, Napoleon was a very high, at least 30, 30 degree, Freemason. And we learned, when we listened to what Tom said in earlier uh, broadcast, like when we did the discussion on the externalization of the hierarchy from Ellis Bailey, that he said that Freemasonry is actually the Protestant arm of the Jesuits. And, of course, Freemasonry in total is on the top controlled by the Jesuits. So what to me is a very interesting point here is that in the Bible it says in two different places, first of all, in, uh, uh, is it in Daniel? Also no, it's just in Revelation. It says in Revelation that this beast is wounded to death and uh, that he that led us into captivity shall go into captivity. That this word of God actually tells us what the Antichrist is doing, or the Antichrist power, because the Jesuits are behind the Vatican. And this is something that you surely understand today when you know that Pope Francis is a Jesuit. So Napoleon, who is a Freemason, which are controlled by the Jesuits, sends a general of his own to Rome to arrest the Pope. Napoleon very well knew what he did at that time. He knew that he was fulfilling Bible prophecy. I think even General Berthier knew that he was doing it. And of course, the people who gave Napoleon the order to do it knew that they were, fulfill, uh, that they were fulfilling Bible prophecy. But that is the interesting point. And this is the proof, if you need any proof, this is the proof that God is in control of everything. Everything the things done for him, and the things done against him. God is in control of everything. Otherwise, he couldn't have written this. Uh, Revelation was written, I don't know, in the 80s, 90s of the first century. Uh, in the latest, 95, I think, they were, they were completely done. So uh, then this was written, and these are the divine words, these are God's words, coming to us, telling us what will happen, and he even uses the, the so-called, let's say, bad guys to fulfill his revelation, his prophecies. Michael, I'll leave it up to you. Uh, well, <clears throat> let's see. Well, it's interesting, one of the interesting points when you look at the involvement of Napoleon and the Freemasons and understanding that the Jesuits are involved in all this mess. And uh, it makes you wonder, you know, uh, was this a Jesuit takeover of the papacy? A kind of, uh, I'm not saying that this is the case. This is just my words. This is just me thinking. I don't have the answer yet. <laughs> But you, know, you look at all these these correlations and the groups that were involved in this. 
uh, and what happened in 1798. Uh, was it a uh, the political moves that were going on with the Vatican City, was this an inside job? Was this uh, a military and political takeover of the Vatican? And with the Jesuits and pretty much since that point actually in control? Now, it's just as a, as a question I'm asking. I'm not saying it's the case. But when I, the more and more I look at this, there are strong suggestions pointing that way, towards that way. I well, don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to, it, but that's something that makes me think big time. So, <laughs> can, can, can I can I can I share, uh, share a thought with you here? Sure. Seventeen ninety eight is a very interesting date because you and I know from the studies that we did on the Vatican and on the Jesuits that by a papal bull, seventeen seventy three the Jesuits have been officially forbidden. They were thrown out of the Roman Catholic Church and they were thrown out of a lot of states. The only places that gave refuge to the Jesuits in that time was Russia and the German state of Prussia. I say German state, but people understand the difference between Russia and Prussia because there was no Germany at the time, but the kingdom of Prussia also gave refuge to the Jesuits, even though Prussia was a Protestant country all the time. I don't understand why they did that, but they did it anyway. Uh, because probably their king was also a Freemason. Uh, that's something very well known. But you know, the Jesuits were forbidden in 1773. In 1770, uh, 1798 then, uh, General Bursier and then Napoleon, who was as I said, controlled by, uh, by, by the Jesuits as a Freemason, sent Berthier into Rome to capture the Pope, and the Jesuits were back allowed by the papacy, by papal bull, in 1814. But in the whole time that the Jesuits were forbidden, a lot happened in this world. For example, oh, yeah. for example the founding of the United States of America in 1776, where, as I have heard, the, at that time, ruling black pope even was present. He faked his death and he was present at the inauguration of the United States in 1776. You have, in, seven, in May 1st, 1776, the foundation of the Bavarian Illuminati, which was a new front organization organized by Alan Weishaupt, who was a professor for canon law at Jesuit University in Ingolstadt in Germany. So, after three years they were forbidden, they came up with a new solution for themselves, and they called themselves Illuminati. In the same year, the founding of America takes place, and some ten years later, you have the French Revolution. Yeah. And the total, and the total abolishment of the Bible and of the word of Christ in France in these years this is also found in uh, some point in the Revelation um, about the two witnesses. Um, they were absolutely dead at that time because the French Revolution was atheistic. It was absolutely no Protestant something. So then you have all these Napoleonic, uh, Napoleonic wars in the end of the 17th and begin, uh, at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. Um, that led to the banishment of Napoleon once, then his return, then his battle here 50 kilometers from where I live in Belgium, Waterloo, and then he was exiled again. And then very interesting, because we are speaking about the Jesuits and how that Napoleon, who was a, at least 30, 30 degree Freemason, I tell you, was Jesuit controlled, he wrote. In his memoirs, the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise. Absolute power. Universal power. Power to control the world by the violation of a single man. Jesuitism 
is the most absolute of despotisms, and at the time, at the same time, the greatest and most enormous of abuses. End quote. So you see that Napoleon was very well aware of who the Jesuits were. And by the way, Napoleon got poisoned in his second exile. <laughs> I don't know if you know that, but when I was a child, I read a book about who killed him. But it states that they have even found hair of him and they found arsenic in his hair. Which means they could really prove afterward that he was really, that, he, that he really was killed. I found that very interesting with the things that I study right now to add to that knowledge. Oh, that yeah. Napoleon was killed. Yeah, you want to say something? The Jesuit oath and what they're willing to do and what they have done—it falls in line with what a Jesuit would do. To Napoleon and poisoning him, so <laughs> and you know, you know, he was uh, a useful tool to acquire, you know, the game, the games that they needed. And then once that was done, they got rid of him. You know, I, am I right about that? I don't know. A lot of what I'm saying is speculation, folks. But on my part, uh, but is I fully connect the history with. You know what's going on? What happened? The Counter Reformation, with these dates and all that. It's and the Jesuits and like it's interesting you brought the Illuminati, and I know this is about you know the, the seven you know that the the points or characteristics of the Antichrist. But since you Jorg and I agree who the Antichrist is, I think it's okay if we deviate a little bit here and there. Um, <laughs> it's a uh, you know, you look at the, the Illuminati and what you mentioned earlier, and, you know, I've had, got an impression this week, tell me what you think, Jorg, that uh, the Illuminati, at this stage of the game at least, and maybe even back then, was nothing more than a cover story for the Jesuits. Because as I look at history of the Illuminati, and then I compare it with the history of the Jesuits, man, they mirror each other a lot. And it's almost like it's 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 almost like what they've used the Illuminati for as a cover story to keep people off track, uh, especially. The, and I hate to say this, hope nobody takes this the wrong way, but godless folks. What I mean by that is people who don't read the Bible, don't believe in Christ. They'll go along with this uh, Illuminati story because they don't want anything to do with the Bible. They don't want anything to do with Christ, and that satisfies their their understanding of things. But as with, but if you study the two groups together, the, I mean, it's, it's more and more I study, the more I realize they really are the same thing. So why is the Illuminati pushed so hard? The only thing I can think of at this point could be wrong, but that it's a cover story for, for the Jesuits. What do you think? Well, ever since I studied <clears throat> the Jesuits and the Illuminati, I have been saying, so you probably didn't catch that when I said that in the, in the past, I always said that they were forbidden in 1773, and in 1776, Adam Weishaupt, professor at Canon Law at Jesuit University in Ingolstadt, that in the university, Jesuit University was not shut down because of the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the Jesuits that they have been forbidden, that they have been thrown out everywhere. Um, I have always said that these Illuminati just were a new front organization for the Jesuits, that they could continue their work under, uh, other, uh, under another name uh, and, and continue their work that they were, that they were doing. They couldn't um, appear as Jesuits that they were before, and a lot of um, their infrastructure was taken away from them, like university schools probably been closed or put other people in there to, to leave them, so they couldn't fall back on all that infrastructure anymore. And uh, they just use, of course, the Illuminati, yeah. And they keep the name Illuminati until today. And they have, uh, that is my understanding of this, and you can, now you can say if you agree or not, there's a special arm of the Jesuits that just deals with the Illuminati stuff. And what I mean by that is most and for all Hollywood. 
uh, is the film industry, is the movie industry, is the music industry, and is uh, the whole entertainment industry, and also for a big part, but not the most part, um, the news industry. But most and for all, the entertainment industry is used for the Illuminati. So when you, you, when, you, when, you, when you take a look at, for example, this documentary, this wonderful documentary on YouTube that you can find, They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll, uh, I think it has more than 30 parts or whatever, and there are a lot of other, uh, when, when you watch one of these uh, on the site, you have uh, proposals of other videos that you can watch that deal with the same subject of um, exposing uh, the symbolists, uh, the symbols, the symbols that are used in the music and in the movie industry, uh, which are satanic uh, by nature, and these are all leading back to the Illuminati. And then you have people like Mark Dice, who goes out there and exposes the Illuminati, or Fritz Springmeier, who exposes the Illuminati and the uh, Committee of 300 and, and all this stuff. Absolutely, I agree. This are, these are the Jesuits, and it's never, it never was something else. Now, of course, people can say, but yeah, the Illuminati in 1776, you also have had other Illuminati in the past. Yeah, that's right. Ignatius of Loyola was coming out of Spain, where they had the secret society of Los Alumbrados. Correct. Which is just the same. It's again the Illuminati. It's just in another language. But what you always have to think about is they can give the child any name they want. With illuminated, they mean knowledge. It always goes back to the Gnostics, the Gnostic movement. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And they have been illuminated with wisdom. They have been illuminated with knowledge. And that is nothing else but Luciferian doctrine. Not satanic, but Luciferian doctrine. Because Lucifer was the light bearer. He was the sun of the morning. He was not the star of the morning. That's Jesus Christ. But he was the sun of the morning. That's hell. He was the illuminated one. The one who had light. The one who had all the wisdom. And when that turns down, it goes down to the people. And people call themselves Los Alumbrados, Illuminati, whatever. But it always means the same thing. And as we covered already in other broadcasts, Albert Pike wrote about it in his book Morals and Dogma on page 301 or 321, uh, where he states that uh, Freemasonry is a religion and the god of Freemasonry is Lucifer. Doubt it not. It works. All right. So, Michael, when you say, I think that the Illuminati are just another front organization for the Jesuits. I applaud you for your, uh, for your view, absolutely, and I absolutely agree with that, uh, 100%. The Illuminati are nothing than another front organization to hide behind. Because right. the Jesuits never appear for what they are in, in reality. Uh, the point is that... Um, you know, you probably heard of, a, of a, a document that is called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Yes. And the Jesuit, was, back, the Jesuit background and the creation of it, yeah, as well. That was, that was a paper <laughs> that appeared in the late 1900s out of Russia. Yeah. And it was supposed to be a paper written by Kabbalistic Talmudic Jews <laughs> for taking over the whole world. What most people do not know and what they don't want to research because they take peace with that explanation. Oh, it's the Jews, it's the Zionists, it's this bad guy over there in Israel and it's the Jews that, ru that rule Hollywood and that it's the Jews that, uh, the Jews that rule our, uh, our, 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 uh, our news world, like, like you have to know, um, Reuters the news agency, the world's biggest news agency, Reuters, that is, Jesu that is uh, not Jesuit, that is Rothschild owned from the beginning. The Rothschilds founded that. And Associated Press is also Rothschild owned. 
And when you go to the Hollywood and you see all these guys who are sitting there on the top of the different uh, movie companies, they are all Jews. But what they don't tell you that behind these Jews, the real owners of these are Knights of Malta. And the Knights of Malta are Gentiles. And the Knights of Malta are controlled by the Jesuits. And the Jesuits are Gentiles. We live in the time of the Gentiles. We do not live in the time of the Jews. We live in the time of the Gentiles. And you can read that in the Bible also for yourself if you don't believe that. And of course, the Jesuits try to take any distraction they can get, any other front organization. They can put out there anybody who is willing to take the blame for that they stay behind the curtain and can pull the strings without being seen. And they do that with the movie industry, they do that with the news industry, they do that with the banking industry, because, you know, we have been talking about the Rothschilds being Knights of Malta, etc., etc. I don't go into detail and, and, and anymore, because otherwise we are just going into repetition. And that's not the point. No. Well, it's, it's, I think it was good that we did talk about anybody who hears this who hasn't heard this before, it gives them food for thought, so... Um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, so it's interesting. This, uh, you know, going back to what we're you were reading here, you know, about the Napoleon in 1798, uh, just the importance of that date and uh, major political uh, events happened that year, and an awful lot of people don't know that they and. Uh, and it's good to be bringing it up. So, well, you know, I just I just said that we are living in the time of the Gentiles. You can you can check that on the Bible because I try and Michael too. We try to tell you the truth as it is proven by the Bible. So when I say you can check that in the Bible, I give you the part where you can look this up. Please do me the favor, and if you don't believe me, look at Luke. Chapter 21, verse 24. Quote, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. End quote. Now, when you read Daniel's 70th week, you know that Jerusalem will be destroyed 70 A.D. Jerusalem was destroyed by the prince, I forgot his name, Tom said that last week, I think. He was the son of the emperor in Rome. Titus, Titus. And Titus, yeah, okay, and it all comes back in waves. <laughs> you have to get my brain the time <laughs> to get it all up. I'm slowly uploading, I'm just a Commodore 64 computer, you know. Um, yeah, the Titus came there and... Uh, and, and, and Jerusalem was drawn down, and the Jews were scattered all over the world until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, Luke states here. So we are told that the time of the Gentiles will not end until Jerusalem is no longer ruled by other nations. Who rules Jerusalem today? You're asking me, it's Rome. <laughs> Well, yeah, we started a little discussion about that last broadcast. So it is now ruled by the Pope of Rome because of the Oslo Accords in 1993. And when you want to check that out, then I give you the link, very charmish, Bye Bye Gaza. And in his book, he quotes the meetings that he, that, that, that he had access to, to meetings around the Oslo Accords in 1993 by Shimon Peres, who said himself that he gave the Pope Jerusalem. So the, the old city of Jerusalem is ruled by the Pope, but the old city of Jerusalem is not the whole of Israel. And the point is that he wants to have not only 60% of Jerusalem, he wants to have all of Jerusalem. So he has 60% and it's not all of it. And of course, his goal is, or the goal of the Roman Catholic churches and the goal of the Jesuits is to control the whole world from the temple in Jerusalem, because that is actually the temple of God. But they put themselves in there because they are in the place of God and want to rule from there. 
whenever that happens, then you know that the New World Order is not merely a conspiracy theory, but an absolute fact. But, uh, you'll see that. Well, the Jesuits have been talking about it for a long, long time now, so, you know, it's, so it's, it's indisputable that... Ignatius of Loyola, before he even founded the Jesuits, he did a trip to Jerusalem because he wanted to present Jerusalem on a silver platter to the Pope. Yeah, it's true. That's what well, he wanted to do. He went there. And he came and he came back with his with with with, with, with his head hanging and uh, and his tail between his uh, between his legs because he couldn't do it. And then uh, afterwards he founded the Society of Jesus and said, "I want to go for for the Pope right there. I want to do that." And and that's the ultimate goal of the Jesuits. And of course now when you when you when, when you watch uh, the news of the Jesuits right now when you when you watch Pope Francis, who is the first Jesuit high level Pope. That is, of course, another step in the wrong, in, in the right direction, because that takes them more into the direction that they have a pope of their choice now, not only being on the black pope seat but also being on the white pope seat. The pope of their choice. Now they have to go for finalize it and go to Jerusalem in there. And by the way, they are going to this one world religion, so that's why you always look in America around you, check out Rick Warren and his promotion of Chrislam, the merger of uh, Christianity and uh, Islam, where of course no Bible-believing Christian will fall for that, so with Chrislam, Christianity, they mean most and for all Roman Catholics who will fall for that, of course. And when you know that the Vatican founded Islam, well, then it's just brother and sister bringing together, right? Um, say that last part again. I don't want to say. When you know that the Vatican invented Islam, then it is just like bringing brother and sister together. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's a way of saying it. Absolutely. I mean, we look at it, my goodness. Once you take away the you know the storyline and the names and all that, that, I mean they're basically the same religion. I mean if you look at the way they worship and how they worship and um, who they worship, um, done on purpose. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, starting with Satan on down. So that's why that's why the Pope always says let's focus on the things that we have in common and not on the things that divide us. The Vatican and the Islam have a lot of things in common, of course, because the one invented the other. The problem is that the other has no idea. I tell you one thing. Every Muslim that I know, if he would have the knowledge that he is nothing else than just a soldier for the Pope, he would absolutely go and deny his faith right there where he stands. But that brings us again to another subject, <laughs> and that is the esoteric and the exoteric policy, policy of organizations like this. You have to know that they work with inside and outside knowledge, and to the outside, they will never tell, of course, that Islam was founded by the Vatican or by the Roman Catholic Church for that matter. So we can really go into the thousands here. It's really starting interesting, but, you know, we have to fill a little bit of time because we don't have the wisdom of Tom Press today. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, going back to what you were saying, too, about because uh, um, the multifaceted aspect of the story of Jerusalem and, and the the obsession that these men have which includes the papacy and all these other groups. And I'm just going to read a little bit out of Rulers of Evil. I strongly recommend people. At some point, I'll finish this reading on my own show. Wonderful. Uh, but at uh, third, page 32, uh, I was talking about Ignatius Loyola and his journey to Jerusalem. This is, and this is uh, uh, Tom, uh, Tupper Saucy's insights and his suggestion of what was gained, uh, it is possible that in a Jerusalem-bound ship named, and I'm going to probably say a few of these names wrong, but uh, Negroni, Negrona, 
commanded by Daigo Mays, uh, turned over the litanies, lists, secret codes, formula, Kabbalah, and other portable assets um, comprising the Knights Templars' resources to Indigo. If this indeed happened, uh, the Western world secret infrastructures was now Loyola's to populate and manipulate in the cause of learning against learning. That is my hypothesis. What is not hypothesis is that as soon as the pilgrim uh, returned from Jerusalem, he began vesting himself with Medici learning. So, and then if you go on and on and learn about that. But my point being, bringing that up is, uh, it's his suggestion, Tupper Saucy's, and I'm starting to recognize it too a little bit, is that it wasn't a complete failure, his mission to Jerusalem. Uh, what has always been of, one of, of great interest to these groups of men, uh, not only Jerusalem itself, but the secrets, if you will, these, the, the secrets of the secret societies, the Kabbalah, all the different um, well, the, the ways that they, they deviate uh, and, and, and uh, communicate with demons and to gain their power in you know, a satanic system that we're, we are slowly learning about because we're not privileged to be part of it, thank goodness. Um, but, you know, we're you start looking at all this whole thing, uh, St. Ignatius Loyola didn't really fail in his mission, it looks like, uh, completely at least. At least it wasn't a complete failure. He gained a whole bunch of knowledge and influence that in and turn helped him to infiltrate the papacy and to create this society of Jesus or the Jesuits and it gives you uh, an, a little bit of an inkling of what they're really about, what they're really interested in. So, you still there? <laughs> they're like running away. <laughs> I can't I didn't fall asleep because it was interesting what you told. Uh, I just, I just uh, shut my mic down that I won't interfere into something and listen to right. what you had to say. And uh, I agree with that. But you know, that is what I said that Ignatius of Loyola did a trip to Jerusalem and this first purpose was to come back to Europe and present Jerusalem on a silver planet to the Pope. Because that would have been his entry. Uh, because he, when he first proposed to the Pope the Society of Jesus, the Pope wasn't interested. And um, he came back later and he convinced the Pope then by saying that the people in the Society of Jesus will take a special fourth vow of obedience to the Pope. And that's when they got inaugurated in 1540 by a papal bull as a new order of the papacy. But, as we learned from Napoleon's reading in his uh, biography, he states that they are not a monastery order, but a military order. That is also why the head of the Jesuits is called the general. Uh, the Pope is not called the general. He's uh, called other names, but never the general. So the Society of Jesus is actually a military order. And of course it is, because when you study the history of the Jesuits, they are the revived Knights Templars. And what were the Knights Templars? Well, they were soldiers. They were mercenaries for the Pope to go to his wars. And today we have the same thing. When you are a member of a military that is in the NATO structure, you are a member of the modern Knights Templar. You don't know it, they don't tell you, but you are. <laughs> no, I, well, I can't argue with that. I mean, it all sounds, it's all logical to me. And... Um... And, uh, you know, between what you're saying and what I just shared, we understand how they actually gained their power. Absolutely. And, you know, By infiltration. And for that, you just have to listen to the speech John F. Kennedy gave, I think it was in 1961, 
about the secret societies. I have I have a video uploaded on my channel, I think, where that speech is in, or on my second channel, I don't know. Really, if you if if you don't know this, Google this. John F. Kennedy's speech on secret societies. And he tells you about a monolithic conspiracy. Yep. A monolithic, what is that? That is from one hand, from one part. That is the hidden hand. That is, he is in that moment calling out the Jesuits for what they are in the way that he could, that he knew he would survive. And he called it a monolithic conspiracy. And that is what he meant by that, the Jesuits. And he knew exactly what he was talking about because he was a Knight of Columbus. Right. Which is just another branch of the Knights of Malta. Well, it's definitely, it's definitely uh, another branch of the military order of Rome. <laughs> I, I, I guess again, the only guess the difference would be is that the Knights of Columbus have a, a specifically a different agenda, and their agenda was this side of, specifically this side of the of the world, in the Western Hemisphere, and in particular the United States, and Roman Catholicizing the United States, and... Yeah, to my knowledge, the uh, military order of the Knights of uh, Columbus only exists in the United States of America, yeah, yeah, and nowhere that's, else. That's, that's, I guess, the only distinguishing, distinguishing difference I can find, really, is that you know, the Knights of Malta is global, if you will, and, and, and their jurisdiction is global, whereas the Knights of Columbus jurisdiction is Uni North America, United States. Am I 100% right about that? I, I won't say that for certain, but it's, all, right it's, all, it's, it's all leading that way, <laughs> that direction, but that's what it seems to be. <laughs> You're right about that, Michael. Don't worry. That's right. <laughs> But you see, we, we, we are getting, again, a little bit distracted from the main topic that we were talking about. We are already one hour into the broadcast, and we have only covered one point. But, okay. I hope, but I hope, for our listeners' sake, that they will enjoy what, they are, what we are telling them, and we are also giving them um, the sources from what we quote, so they can research it for themselves. Listen. Whoever you are out there and listening to this, don't take my word for it. Don't take Michael's word for it. Do your own research. Take the sources that we tell you as a help to research it for yourself. Only the truth that you find out for yourself is the truth that you know is true. We can only tell you, we can only show you the way. You have to walk it yourself. Right. Yeah, and by the way, also it is relevant what we're talking about because it's all—all all these are tentacles of the same beast that we're now reading about. The Antichrist system—they're all tentacles of this Antichrist system. So it is relevant. But if you'd like to get back on the, the article, we certainly can. Yeah. Okay. We have to deal with the characteristic number seven. The Antichrist receives deadly wounds and later heals. Revelation 13, verse three. Quote, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. End quote. I did read the same quote already in the point before, but we need this right now too. As we just saw, the quote, deadly wound, unquote, was given to the papacy by Napoleon in 1798. The Vatican still continued as a church, however but she was completely slipped of her civil and political power, just as the prophecy declared. Then, suddenly, in 1929, we see the Italian government recognizing Vatican City once again as an independent state. This political move once again made the Pope a religious political power, just as prophecy said, the mortal wound that was administered in 1798 by Napoleon was supposed to be healed. Notice how the newspapers of that day actually used prophetic language without realizing it. I'm going to read a quote now from the San Francisco Chronicle, February 11th, 1929. Quote, The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past 
and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the autographs to the memorable document healing the wound of many years extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides end quote a very interesting um, piece of this is to see that this is the starting of the heal of the wound and the Lateran Treaty that we were just talking about here was one of many concordats, as they are called, treaties the Vatican makes with states. And you have the same thing a few years later in Germany. Hitler rose to power in March 1933. In the month of July 1933, less than half a year in power in Germany, Germany signed a concordat with the Vatican through von Papen, who was the vice chancellor under Hitler, who was a high level Jesuit, and he signed the concordat with Cardinal Pacelli. Cardinal Pacelli later became Pope Pius XII. Well, I was reading the, um, the newspapers of that day. So that was the San Francisco Chronicle from February 11, 1929, and now the New York Times, July 7, 1929. Quote, from 11 o'clock this morning, there was another sovereign independent state in the world. At that time, Premier Mussolini, as Italian foreign minister representing King Victor Emmanuel, the first Italian premier ever to cross the threshold of the Vatican, exchanged with Cardinal Gaspari, Papal Secretary of State, representing Pope Pius XI, ratifications of the treaties signed at the Lateran Palace on February 11th. By that simple act, the sovereign independent state of Vatican City came into existence. End quote. Now there's one little more point that I want to uh, emphasize for our listeners. And that is when you read the first quote from the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, it was said, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy. Now, this is very important that it starts with Italy. Because when the wound was inflicted to the papacy in 1798 by General Berthier, and the civil or temporal power of the Vatican was taken away, took until 1870 that also Italy denounced the Vatican's temporal power. It was just the time between 1870 and 1929 when the Pope had no power over one state officially at all. In the hey, hey Yor, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that a little bit from 1870? What happened then? In 1870, the yeah. uh, Italian Republic uh, did, um, did not accept the Vatican's temporal power anymore. It's true. Uh, so it took between 1789, when the wound was deflected by capturing the Pope in the first place, until 1870, until all of the countries rejected the temporal power of the Vatican. Italy was the last country to do so. And that happened in 1817. And just this country, of course, the Vatican is seated in Italy. <laughs> nice by effect. <laughs> um, just, that, uh, just that state in 1929 was the first to then again um, ratificate or, or, or to accept um, Vatican City as a, city st as a state. Uh, as a sovereign and independent state in 1929. And of course, Mussolini was put there by, you guessed it, the Jesuits, the fascist leader of Italy. So yeah. these were two, uh, I think, very important quotes from newspapers all around the world, the San Francisco Chronicle and the New York Times on July 7th of 1929. Fact is, Many know that the devil always seeks to mock or counterfeit the truth 
in the word of God relating to Christ and his ministry. For example, the virgin birth was counterfeited by the birth of Tammuz, the son of Nimrod, on December 25th. Have you ever noticed this, though? Jesus walked the earth exactly three and a half years before being killed. He then resurrected, just as prophecy declared he would. The Antichrist walked about killing people for exact three and a half prophetic years, or 1260 days, which is actually 1260 years in reality. His main man, the Pope, is then, quote, killed, unquote, by Napoleon when he dies in exile, and the Vatican is no longer in power. But the Antichrist also resurrected in 1929. This prophetic jurisprudence is no mistake. Plus, it now leads to my favorite prophecy of all when exposing Rome and its true satanic fruit. The beast that is one that was, is not, and yet is, which will be characteristic number eight of the Antichrist to read on. Michael, some closing thoughts on this topic uh, from you? Well, uh, yeah. Well, the only thing I it's uh, it's an observation of little value, except for the fact that it kind of supports uh, how the Satan likes to mimic uh, God and His prophecies. If you look at 1929, in the midst of that year, or around that time, is you know the papacy was restored, and then three and a half years later. They put Hitler in, the, in the office, so <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, you know is that prophetic? No, I don't think so. Is that the Vatican or you know playing with it and you know mocking it or Satan mocking it? Uh, could could be could be. I don't know. I, I don't believe it's a coincidence. It's not three and a half years. Huh? What's that? What is from, the, from the 11th of February 1929 until the 1st of March 1933, it's more than three and a half years. Eh? Is it more than three and a half years? Yeah, yeah. 1929, 30, 31, 32, 33. Okay. It's four years, right? It's a little, a little under but three, four years. Okay, it's not, it's not the three and a half years, and, uh, uh, and also Hitler is not an antichrist or whatever. But, of course, these, these dates are all very, uh, very much linked together. And uh, what, uh, what I find very interesting about this is, uh, and I quote this again from what Nicholas wrote here, Jesus walked the earth except three and a half years before being killed. This is the time between his baptism and his crucifixion. Yeah. Yeah. He then resurrected just as prophecy declared he would. So there is no time between that, okay? Of course, it was three days, but that's not the point. The Antichrist walked about killing people for exact three and a half prophetic years, 1260 days, which is actually 1260 years in reality. So you have three and a half earthly years that Jesus does his ministry before being killed on the cross, and you have three and a half prophetic years that the Antichrist rules before he is taken with the sword into captivity. And those connections are no accident. Well, that's for certain. I agree with that. And, and thanks for pointing out the dates there. It's, it's still interesting. I find it interesting how close Hitler also came to power. And, you know, and um, is he? Yeah, you know, you know, they do. <laughs> they knew that they couldn't do with the Italians what they could do with the Germans. Yeah, it's amazing how fast they, from that point on, how they they've have taken over so much control from the 1929 to this day, and you know, it all leads to uh, some bad times ahead of us, that's for sure, and. Uh, Anyways, or I could, I'll, I'll shut up about that. We'll go on in this article. <laughs> I, could, oh. I could take us over to a, a, a many different directions. Uh, but, you know, it is uh, it is all relevant, and I think so, at least at this point, talking about all these things, because they're all connected to the Antichrist. You know what I mean? 
Mm-hmm. And he's involved in all of this. They are involved in all of this, I should say. And uh, um, they all lead, all these situations and scenarios and historical events uh, lead back to Rome. <laughs> they all do. It's amazing. So. All roads lead to Rome because, as I told you already before, Rome built all the roads. Yeah, she did. <laughs> and she maintains them too. She keeps them going. So. Yeah, the ones important for them. Yeah, the ones that we just used to ride on, we can be very glad that we have very good cars to ride on. Yeah, but they are not very well maintained. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we come to the next point, that is, the beast is one that was, is not, and yet is. Now, to understand this, how a beast was, that is not, and yet is, we have to go to Revelation 17, verse 8. And I'm going to read that in complete before uh, we go further in the article. Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pits and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. End quote. The beast that was. The Roman church began in 538 A.D., and continued until Napoleon sent General Berthier in 1798 A.D and is not, from 1798 A.D. until the signing of the Lateran Treaty in 1929, the Roman Church was non-existent. Um, the Roman Church state was not existent. The Roman Church was existent. The Church state was not existent. And yet is, from 1929 to present, the Roman Church has been a church and state. And uh, let me add here, from 1929 on until, like we gave the example in 1933 by Hitler, who signed the Concordat, that is absolutely, when you look that up on Wikipedia, that treaty that Hitler signed with the Roman Catholic Church, that Concordat, is still in working today. They teach us in Germany that all the Nazi laws have been abolished. But when you look deep enough, you see that all the Nazi laws are still in working. And that is one of them. The Concordat with the Roman Catholic Church still is in work today. And since that time, since 1929, the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, is starting to have uh, political relations with every other state in the world. They have embassies, in every state, or, well, they don't call it embassies, I think, because they have another name for that, eh? but it's exactly the same as the United States has an embassy over here and over there. That's exactly the same that also the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican has, but they don't call it an embassy. They have another name for that. I don't know that right now. So that's not the point. But they are going to make Concordat over Concordat over Concordat again with all the states in the world. And when they have one with all of them, you have to read what in the, what in the Concordat it says. For example, in the German Concordat it says that this treaty gives the Roman Catholic Church the right to practice their religion, to found schools, kindergartens, universities, churches, seminaries, and all that stuff, freely in that country. And when you have that all over the world, in every country, even not so small, even Liechtenstein or whatever, Monaco, then you will have the wound that is totally being healed. Then the Roman pontiff has power over all the countries back again. This prophecy that we're just reading is so blunt and to the point there is no need of explaining it. In fact, the one studying these facts has already investigated the three previous prophecies that defined each state of this beast's existence throughout history. End quote. This is what um, Nicholas uh, writes in his document about this beast that 
was, is not, and yet is. So, in that point, uh, in that regard, I think I made my point right now. And um, you see, um, we are going from point to point, and Revelation 17 is also uh, very interesting to read here, uh, what we just did. So, Michael, you have any closing remarks on this point? Because otherwise I will go on to point eight a little bit later. Not really. Like you said, it's blunt. It's straight to the point. There's no point in the much to debate about. <laughs> you know? No, I really don't have much to say about that. Um, I say we move on, if you're ready. Okay. 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 Uh, characteristic number eight of the Antichrist. Antichrist is to be a blasphemous power. To blaspheme. Well, wow, that's very interesting. Um, before I go reading into this, I have to tell you that you have to check out um, the broadcasts on uh, Nothing But The Truth. Um, and there was one done on the 11th of December, so just a few days ago, by Tom Fress, Blasphemy. And he explains in detail what blasphemy actually is, and that it is not just using the name of Jesus Christ or God as a curse or in vain, but that it is much more than that. So Antichrist is to be a blasphemous power. Michael, any thoughts here, or shall I just continue now? Just keep, keep on continuing. I, I do want to, yeah, there's a, you know, your show you had a couple of weeks ago and brought up a, a Breaking Bad. Yeah. And guess for guess for just wants to say thanks to you. It's an excellent series. He just wanted me to thank you. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope he enjoys uh, learning from that series because yeah. that's the hope, most important part. Yeah, I hope it's not just entertainment. Yeah, we don't want to. We we have en enough of that, don't we? So absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Antichrist to be a blasphemous power. Revelation 13, verse 1, quote, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and above, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy, end quote. Blasphemy, uh, blasphemy is biblically defined in John 10, 33, quote, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God, end quote. Well, if you want to go deeper in this, I started listening to the broadcast of Tom Fress of Blasphemy uh, from the 11th of December, and he deals with this part of John there. So then you can just listen to that. Otherwise, I uh, will read now a few quotes that come from the first one, the Catholic National from July 1895, quote, the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. Or another quote from Pope Leo XIII, encyclical letter of June 20th, 1894, just a year before that. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. And we have a quote from Labbe and Cassard's History of the Councils, volume 14, column 109, quote, For thou art the shepherd, thou art the physician, thou art the director, thou art the husbandman, finally thou art another god on earth, end quote. The title, quote, Lord God, Lord God the Pope, unquote, is found within the gloss of extravagantes of Pope John the 22nd, title 14, chapter 4. In an Antwerp edition of the Extravagantes, the words Dominum Deum Nostrum Papam, meaning Our Lord the Pope, can be found in column 153. In a Paris edition, they are found in column 140. A uh, little note from here, I always find it interesting when Belgium comes into this, but I live in Antwerp. That's, um, I, I, I was there a few days ago. I go there regularly for my work. <laughs> Antwerp, yeah. Continuing, the bull Unang Sanctum, issued by Pope Boniface VIII, reads as false, quote, 
The Roman pontiff judges all men, but is judged by no one. We declare, assert, define and pronounce. To be subject to the Roman pontiff is to every human creature necessary for salvation. That which was spoken of Christ, thou hast subdued all things under his feet, may well seem verified in me. I have the authority of the King of Kings. I am all in all and above all, so that God himself and I, the Vicar of God, have but one consistory, and I am able to do all that God can do. End quote. Quote, the Savior himself is the door of the sheepfold. Quote, I am the door of the sheep, unquote. Unto this fold of Jesus Christ, no man may enter unless he be led by the sovereign pontiff, and only if they be united to him can men be saved. For the Roman pontiff is the vicar of Christ and his personal representative on earth, unquote. Pope John XXIII, in his homily to the bishops and faithful assisting at his coronation, on November 4th in 1958. Of course, there are but a few quick quotes of the popes proving they believe they are God on earth. I have dozens more on my words on the beast page. So when you go to remnantofgod.org, just go to the words of the beast page and uh, then you can find a lot of more of these quotes. What amazes me is if some small cult leader was to proclaim himself God on earth, the authorities would snatch him up in a heartbeat. Yet the popes of Rome can proclaim this lie for almost 2,000 years, and no one seems to mind. By the way, claiming to be God on earth is only one biblical definition of blasphemy. Another is claiming to have the power to, quote, forgive men's sins, unquote. Mark uh, 2, verse 7 states, quote, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Unquote. Is it possible the Roman Catholic Vatican does this as well? Can prophecy be accurate and exposing of this evil entity? Yes, it can. The confessional of the Roman Catholic Church is indeed yet another identifiable feature exposing the Vatican as Antichrist's dwelling. They openly, de they openly declare a man dressed as a priest has the power to forgive sins of men. Quote, this judicial authority will even include the power to forgive sin. Unquote. The Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, Article Pope, page 265. And another one. Quote, and God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priest and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse to give absolution provided the penitent is capable of it, end quote. Liguri, from Duties and Dignities of the Priests, page 27. And this continues characteristic eight of the Antichrist. Michael, some thoughts here? Well, yeah, I, you know, a lot of this is, of course, we've gone over this many a time, but the thing that I thought was great for Nicholas is that when he brought up uh, what amazes me is that if some if some small cult leader was uh, to proclaim himself God on earth, the authorities would snatch him up in a heartbeat. Yet the Pope of Rome can proclaim this lie for almost 2,000 years, and no one seems to mind. That's a very profound statement. The more you, you really look into this statement... Um, not just because of the fact that you know he's right about the fact that if anybody else, if like David Koresh or some other group shows up, then you know they're going to crush them unless they find use in them. But it's the fact that here we have we have a countless of people who are experts on quote unquote cults and will not mention the number one cult of all: Rome, Roman Catholicism. And that's not a bigoted statement on my part. I mean, if you look at the parameters of what a cult is, and then you go and look at the Rome, how you cannot come up with a realization that it is a cult, you have to be completely dishonest. <laughs> you have to be so deceived beyond belief, and the dishonesty in it is just 
mind blogging, uh, blowing. And and to think that this particular cult runs our lives, influences our lives in so many different ways, and as he points out, for a couple thousand years now, and nobody does anything about this, says uh, volumes of what this group is, who they, who they, how they control things, how the uh, the dragon has given its power to this group. It just goes on and on and on. And you know, people should really start thinking about this seriously. And uh, whether Roman Catholic or not, whether Christian or not, you really address this and be honest about it. And I know it's going to be very difficult because of all the ingrained biases and indoctrinations that we have had in our lives. And it takes a lot of work and energy to finally pop out of the delusion that well, most of us are in, that somehow Rome is innocent or is a Christian body or represents Christ in any way. But uh, the truth of the matter is, it's the complete opposite. And, you know, as we keep on talking about these different aspects and points, not only the identifying characteristics of the Antichrist, but then all of its different... Uh, you know, these tentacles, if you will, it's the branches and his organizations, his secret societies, and how his, his, his machinations and how it influences everything about our lives. You, you know, nothing seriously is ever going to change in, in our lives, you know, whether it's supposed to or not, until, you know, at least we get honest about this one fundamental fact of who Rome is. And it seems like so few people are capable of even seeing it. They can, you know, the force through the trees, you know, or the tree, you know. So, anyways, that's what I wanted to say. Everything else has been said numerous times on this show, and uh, will be said numerous times more on this show. So, and hopefully, that some of this sinks into folks' brain. <laughs> but anybody who calls himself, you know, the representative or equivalent to or God himself, uh, you know what? I, if I were you, I'd turn the other way. You're asking for a whole heck of a lot of trouble in your life. So, so with that, I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that you use the word cult because I was already for weeks planning to make a video on the Pope uh, saying that he is God on earth. Uh, based on a video that I found that I got on an upload mail, I think it even comes from Nicholas, uh, on how to identify a cult. And there, and he has a lot of these quotes, and uh, I was going to make my own video on that. And uh, as I told you before the show started here, that uh, I do not work until the beginning of next year now, because not because I'm lazy, but because I sell wine, and uh, there's nothing much to do for me in this time of year anymore. Um, I will probably go into that, and not only that video, I think I will make a few videos in the, in the, in the spare time, and uh, deal also with this blasphemous uh, subject that we just went through and that you just explained, uh, also using the word cult. Yeah. Cool. Hey, uh, and, uh, and, and whether, whether we use uh, or we say something double or three times or four times, you know, uh, the lies in this world are repeated so often that we cannot repeat the truth often enough. And there was a smart man who, ever, who, who, who said, um, a lie told often enough becomes the truth. So we have to see that we tell the truth often enough that people will understand the truth of it also. I agree. So. Anyways, uh as you get on to this next reading, I am going to be listening to you, but I've got to step away from the conversation for about two or three minutes. But I, w I will. So if you're asking, Mike, what do you, and I don't respond, it's because my mic will be off, but I am listening. So, okay? I, I will take that into account. Okay. <laughs> I'm not ignoring my friend. So. <laughs> no, no problem. You right. also have the recording. You can listen to it afterwards, right? <laughs> no, no, I'm going to, I, I can listen. I have a, a poor, I have wireless headset, so. Oh, yeah, okay. You're ahead of me, then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, the next point, or the next um, characteristic of the Antichrist, 
is the Antichrist is to be able to influence the entire world to worship him. Well, this is certainly not an easy thing to do, but when we read Revelation 13, verse 8, we read, quote, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, end quote. To worship is to be in agreement with that which you worship. Are not all Christians in agreement that the Lord Jesus is correct in his truth? Strong's Concordance defines the word worship in this way. Worship, proskinuo, from 4314 and the probable derivative of 2965, so this is the numbers they're using there, meaning to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. AV, worship 6060, one, to kiss the hand two towards one in token of reverence. Among the Orientals, especially the Persians, to fall upon the knees and touch the ground with the forehead as an expression of profound reverence. That's what the, Islamists, uh, what the Muslims do every time when they go pray. And third, in the New Testament, by kneeling to protest, uh, prostration, to do homage or one, uh, to one, or make ob obeisance, whether in order to express respect or to make supplication. Worship can be done by simple agreement. However, it can also be done by an open act. In Daniel 3, we see that as fact, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abekno refused to bow down before the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar set up for the people, the entire nation bowed, of course, but those three students of Daniel bluntly refused. Were they fanatics, as some would call them today? Or was God about to define that act as an open act of worship, regardless of what the person felt in his heart? For example, do you honestly believe all those people worshipped that idol the king set up that day merely because he asked them to? Could it be the majority of them were bowing out of fear and not worship? Truth is, the king stated plainly in Daniel 3, verse 6, that Quote, Whosoever falleth not down and worshippeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, fiery furnace. End quote. Common sense affords, <clears throat> affords us the reality that it was fear that caused them to bow. Yet Daniel's students still refused. Could it be just the simple act of worship is enough to commit the sin? Indeed, it is. For this is confirmed when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into that furnace of fire. It was so hot that the men that threw them were engulfed in flames and killed by doing so. However, Jesus Christ himself appeared in the flames to prevent harm to those three young men. This confirmed the Lord was pleased with their refusal to merely bow. He rewarded their refusal to break commandment, uh, commandment number two with an open sign that no thinking person could deny. It was so graphic, in fact, that King Nebuchadnezzar himself was moved to believe. When he saw those three young men walking in the flame without Ill if any ill effects, at the same time looking upon his own muscle-bound guards lying dead at the entrance of that furnace, he knew something amazing happened that day. He realized that nearly, knowing, uh, nearly bowing before that, state, uh, that statue he set up was sin. Daniel records this king's reaction rather well. Daniel 3, verse 24 through 30, quote, Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered, and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered, and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the force is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and spake, and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, upon those whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head signed, singed. 
neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, and they might not serve <clears throat> nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. End quote. Did you notice, even the king agreed that bowing before his golden statue was an act of worship? He said with his own mouth that God has sent his angel to protect those three young men, quote, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god, unquote. So, how does Roman Catholicism fulfill this prophecy? Are Catholics taught to worship the Pope? Is the entire world taught to do this as well? In John chapter 17, we read this. John chapter 17, verse 11, quote, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. End quote. Jesus is in the garden praying just before Judas arrives with the mob to take him away to be crucified. In this prayer, Jesus actually calls his Father in heaven, Holy Father. Every Catholic honors, every priest, every cardinal, every bishop, and every nun is taught to call the Pope Holy Father. Even the media calls him this blasphemous name. Every newspaper, magazine, TV news, and anchorman Radio announcer uses that title for the Pope. Plus, every dignitary, president, or head of state must kiss the hand of the Pope, either in private or before the cameras, to make a statement. We have all seen the many pictures of people kissing the Pope's ring. From the common man to mainstream political entities, they must all kiss this man's hand. This is an open act of worship. The Pope is receiving with complete agreement. Often the Pope won't even raise his hand for the person to kiss it. They literally have to bow before him and kiss his hand, dangling at his side, as we see the British dignitary doing in this photo that you will see when you take a look at the website that I'm reading from. It used to be not so many days past that this was the Pope's foot you must kiss, as is shown in this etching that is below here and uh, a little uh, addition from myself. Therefore, they have the statue of so-called Peter in the Vatican, that is actually Jupiter. And uh, when you look at his red, uh, right foot, uh, his toes are not to be seen anymore. This is just one mass of uh, this metal that is used to make that figure because of all the kissing that has been done through the centuries on that uh, on that statue in the Vatican. Truth is, many Catholics to this day are taught that it is acceptable, uh, that it is an acceptable act of worship towards the Pope. In St. Peter's Basilica, ah, okay, <laughs> there's a statue that is called Peter. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't read that before, so <laughs> ah, spoiled it. Uh, truth is, the statue was originally called Jupiter. But when the Vatican mixed paganism with Christianity, they renamed a, lo a lot of the pagan gods, uh, giving them Christian names. Notice the foot of the statue. It is extended out so as to make it easier for the, uh, for the passers-by to bow before as to kiss it. Notice also the foot is worn down so smooth that even the features uh, of the toes are all but completely erased. This is a bronze statue. Can you imagine how many millions and millions of kisses it would take from the soft lips of Catholics the world over to wear the metal away from the statue? This is just amazing. Please pray for these devout people. They have such a misdirected zeal. 
If they would direct their worship towards the true God of all creation, imagine how wonderful that would be. The other definition of worship would be to lie, uh, to lie prostrate before a statue or a person. Does the Pope even accept this type of extreme reverence? Below, please take a look at the group of priests that are seeking the Pope's approval to be ordained as Roman Catholic priests. It's amazing to me that the Vatican would allow such pictures to be made public. One of these pictures is a recent picture of uh, Pope John Paul accepting worship from what appears to be at least 80 young priests to be. And the next is probably the same amount of another Pope many years ago. This, uh, this prophecy is most assuredly fulfilled by the popes of Rome. Nowhere on earth do you see such a man as this that is not only accepted, but is openly worshipped before the eyes of the universe. And that ends characteristic number eight. So, of course, it helps when you have the documents that I'm reading from uh, opened in the Internet. So I think that we will provide this link, of course, later on the... When, when you do the uh, do the broadcast, uh, hey, yeah. put, hey. the, put the link in there so people can see that. Uh, I, you talk about this article. I already did that. Oh, okay. So then that hey, can... listen. I got this as a side note here. There's a gentleman, Edward. I, uh, I guess he's got his own blog talk show, and he's friends with Walt, and he he's talked to you. And do you know who I'm talking about? He's in Canada. Do you, are you have you have you been able to access the chat room yet? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen what he sort of? Uh, it looks like he wants to join us. Um, yeah, okay. Do you know who he is? Have you had a conversation with him or? Um, I didn't follow the conversation they have here. I don't know if I know any Edward. I have to check all my Skype contacts right now, but I do most of the reading, so <laughs> I, I can't do. I, I'm not a woman. I cannot uh, multitask. So <laughs> uh, no, he he can introduce himself. So uh, if anybody wants to uh, wants to be part of the broadcast, um, yeah, sure. I I I. Ah, I, he knows Poldy. Okay, uh, our mutual friend from Wall Sticker, right? The Bavarian German, ninety plus year old, who wrote, who writes, his, uh, who writes his own Bible. Oh, is that how he, he knows? Is that who he knows? Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I know Edward. Yeah, okay. Then I know him. We we, we, we talked. We talked already. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, if, if he if, if he finds a way to join in, uh, he's he's well, he's most welcome. Uh, yeah. No problem with that. Uh, I, I'm just sorry that I spoiled the point of the figurine of Jupiter there. <laughs> I remembered that, and I didn't know that uh, this article was dealing with that. So. Oh, that's okay. That's definitely... You know, what's fascinating is how many dignitaries. It's not just, you know... Uh, you know, we, you got... Was it Arafat kissing the ring? You got the king of... Uh, the king of Edward, not Edward. What's his name? King of Charles... Kissing the ring, you got uh, all these men. The presidents. Who's King Charles? Is that King Charles in that picture there? Uh, or Edwards, or who is it? He's one of the kings. He, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not. It looks. It's such a blurry picture. It's picture I don't know. It's Prince Charles. Prince Charles. That's what I meant. Oh it's my still, God. It's still. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, why yeah. I understand. It's still yeah. Elizabeth, right? Yeah. My apologies. You're right. He's a prince. <laughs> but. Um, uh, it's amazing how many uh, of these dignitaries, these quote unquote powerful men, uh, go to this pope and they they bow down to him and um, and kiss his ring or his foot or uh, should say something, folks. It's not just by accident. And people say, well, it's all because there's religious devotion. Well, um, I, like I said, they got a picture of Arafat there. I just, I, just little, I just have a little side note on this hand kissing. Uh -huh. Did you ever watch the movie The Godfather? Oh, yeah. There you can see the connection of the Mafia to the Roman Catholic Church. Oh, because yeah. the Godfather's hand is also kissed in obedience, in worship, in respect, whatever you want to call it. Oh, that's interesting. Now that I think about that, it's almost like a, a, a kind of a subliminal message, too. Right? I just sounded like uh, President Bush there, subliminal. <laughs> but anyways, uh, 
uh, yeah, you think about that. It's almost like a, a hidden message there, huh? Um, and maybe more. But uh, what? Why would any man kiss any man's hand? Doesn't make much sense to me. That's for sure. Well, if I kiss, I kiss anything. It's not a man. It's uh, it's a woman. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Anyway, uh, guess fine. Edward, if he wants to join us, can he call in? Well, he, I think I just, yeah, call in and it, uh, you call her ID, bring him in, right? I, shoot, I can't remember now how, how to go about it. This is pretty pathetic because my show and it's, uh, I use this format, but. Yeah, I I don't know if that's a Skype name. I don't know Edward. He knows you. I don't know him. Yeah, that's why I'm just asking because uh, at first I thought he was talking about me, but now that I'm looking at, it, he realized he was talking about you. Oh <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's him. Okay, so <clears throat> maybe I can add him to the call, or I don't know if that uh, if that works. Uh, you could try and see what happens. Uh, or maybe I have to add him in here. Why don't you? Uh, yeah, but I have him as a contact. You don't in Skype, right? No, I don't. But you can you, in Skype. You could if it's all right with you, Edward. He can uh, send me your Skype address, and then I will. That's friend, a possibility. I can then request you as a friend, and then bring you in, since I'm the one that's made the call. So, <clears throat> so if you send me that, and uh, then I'll see if. If that works, so and he can come in and join and see what his two cents are and all this. So, yeah, just tell, give me, send me. If that works, or or you can send him my Skype address. Well, I just see if I can add him here. Okay, I try to add him to the conversation, so we will see if he goes in. Yeah, let's we'll see what happens. Edward, we're trying to add you into this conversation, so. And um, if it works, it works, and if it doesn't, oh, here we go. Well, you see him on your Skype right now, too, so. Uh, you know, he just, he, um uh, oh, it didn't work. Okay. Anyway, uh, let's not um, go too far away from the topic that we were yeah, but I just added you, and you probably didn't answer. So what can I do? <laughs> uh, uh, just uh, going on with uh, point nine, then, or is there anything else about uh, characteristic number eight that you still want to add about this kissing uh, of feet or of hands or uh, whatever? Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, to me, there is one thing that I really like to add because there are so many people that say. Uh, no, the Pope doesn't rule the world. Um, you know, uh, where everybody goes to, and uh, uh, every president and so goes to uh, in, in the world, but it's uh, the Pope, and they and they kiss their uh, and they kiss his um, they kiss his, his hands or his feet or, or whatever. So they are just blatantly out in the open. When you see these pictures here, and you have the same pictures of Obama and of George W. Bush. Uh, and, and in all these presidents going to the Pope and kissing his hand, uh, that is an act of worship, as explained by uh, Nicholas here in this article. Yeah. yeah. It looks like we're failing with that. So. Uh, yeah. Let me just let me just continue, right? I say so. Yeah. Until uh, I'll try to sort out on my end while you're doing so. Characteristic number nine uh, must be Antichrist must be able to understand dark sentences of hell. Daniel 8.23, we read, quote, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall hold up. End quote. Oh, hold on a second. Is this, is this Edward? Yeah, is that, I, I'm connected now. Okay, there you are. Hello. You got you got a radio or something going on, Edward? Well, yeah, it's it's the broadcast from Shultark. That's there. You're gonna have to turn that off because there's an echo. Okay, I'll turn it off. 
Mm -hmm. Just put the, just uh, click on the pause on the play sign on the pause sign on the on the broadcast. Yeah. Okay. okay I'll I'll take a look at this. <laughs> it is a live show, folks. So it is not okay. perfect. Show. Just just close the uh, shoe okay. talk. No, just just uh, push on the uh, on the pause button. You have there uh, on on your uh, on your right down there. You have uh, you have play and pause. Right. If you have trouble hearing, and then you can adjust the volume. And before that, you have a pause button. Just hit that pause button. You have play and pause. Okay, we're, we're, we're echoing. Look, it, it's down. Is it down near? On the right, on the right, down corner. Okay. Of the window of the broadcast. Okay, where it says shoe talk. No, above that, trouble hearing, and then you have this streaming and this pause sign. There you have to push pause. Uh, okay. Uh, trouble hearing, and then you have this streaming and this pause sign. It's just above the talk shoe logo. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just not familiar with this talk shoe. Okay, right above it. Okay, it says free. And it's a talk, trouble hearing. Just the trouble hearing. You have this pause sign. Just okay. click pause. Okay, is it to the to the right or the left of talk? On the left of that. Okay, I see. Okay, a little uh, icon. Yeah, a little icon for pause. Okay, how's that? Better. That's better. Okay, I think I got it. Okay, just getting familiar with the system. Okay. Okay. We all are. Okay, anyway, welcome, I, welcome, welcome, Edward. Introduce yourself, please, because uh, I do not remember that much. We talked numerous times on Skype. I remember that. Yeah, well, uh, we, so. yeah, well, we, uh, you, I know my friend Paul. I know him for a long time, and his intentions are very pure yeah, in uh, fixing what he sees as some errors in the Bible and uh, things like that. And he's, you know, he, uh, you already know, he worked. He was in Germany and uh, it worked uh, was under Hitler and all that, eh? So. Edward, before we go any further about this Paul Lee guy, we don't really, I don't want to go, go down that road in the oh. show. Okay. We're talking about the, uh, the characteristics of Antichrist in this article, so we'll still spend too much time on personal talk. Okay, listen. Okay. Okay. And, but I will ask you this. You say you have a blog talk show, do you? Yes. What's the name of your blog talk show? It's called Independent News Report. Okay, Independent News Report. Yeah, I, and what I do is I do sound clips from independent news sources, like the realnews.com and things like that, that is financed by the donors that try to get discussion going on things like that I do a lot of exposure on the on the banking system and the money system and and, and, and stuff like that eh? okay so you are talking about Karen Hudis he's, he's talking uh, on the radio program I've done a lot of exposures on the financial system yeah so you were talking also about Karen Hudis Oh, oh yeah, I, I got her recording on one of my programs. But the thing is, is it's very, very difficult for me to validate anything that anybody's saying on these things. I just kind of like collect the information and sharing it and talk about it. You know, you're going to really do some research into the background of these people, eh? And that's where the difficulty starts. That's right. I always had my reservations when uh, listening to Karen Hulis because she was uh, very high uh, in the ranking of the World Bank for years. Yeah. And uh, now, now the last year she comes out with the revelation of uh, the banking system being run by the Jesuits and the Vatican. Yeah. And I think that is my personal opinion uh, that she is controlled opposition, that she is just giving away parts of the truth, not telling it all, to stir people up, uh, the same like Alex Jones does. So, so that people, uh, she can be a vehicle that people listen to, mm -hmm. 
but then she might be she might be used. I think that she has an agenda, you know, because when somebody comes out and says things like she does, and she can man- she, she can maintain the big company that she has, and she can maintain this uh, big website that she has without being attacked by the Jesuits, then she has to be working in accordance with Jesuits. It's a little bit. It's a little bit like Eric John Phelps. Yeah. Eric John Phelps is by many seen as a real truther but yeah. they don't expose his lies. I yeah. haven't been studying Karen Hooters enough to expose her lies, but I have been studying Eric John Phelps enough to expose his lies. Okay. When he stands up and says George Washington was not a Mason because he didn't attend a, a, a Freemason Lodge for 30 years, uh, and he was a Baptist, then I can only point out um, that he was a Freemason, and that is on the... Uh, on the painting, on the ceiling of the capital that you see on top there, where he is deified, made God. And then you tell me again that he is a Bible-believing Christian? I don't think so. Well, they live a double life. And um, Eric John Phelps also does other things where he is uh, exposed as a shill like he never talks about the role of the Carols in the founding of the United uh, States of America in 1776 and all this stuff. So What, what they do with I'm, I'm, al- I'm always very, very careful with, with people like these before uh, spreading news of them, you know. What they do is they live a double life. Beg your pardon? What they do is they... They, they li- live a, deb- uh, a double life. I, in the city here, I used to know uh, uh, a Freemason. But he actually he he was a Christian, and he went kind of made, got involved with it, you know, to make business uh, contacts. And then he found out what it was about. That he was basically he discussed the thing with me, and basically they have to live a double life. Mm. Of course they live a double life, and you cannot serve two masters. You cannot be a Freemason and a Christian. That's impossible. Because as we already established in other broadcasts here, Freemasonry is a religion, a Luciferian religion, uh, as, uh, uh, as, uh, being, as being uh, uh, proven by uh, Albert Pike's writing in the book Morals and Dogma. Okay. And now another fact that I found out, I came in contact with a, another Freemason, a younger guy, and he told me, we discussed these different things about the churches and various things like that. He told me that the churches are Masonically controlled. Uh, all churches are Jesuit controlled today. Yeah, Methodists, Baptists, whatever they call themselves, that is the ecumenical movement that started with Vatican II. Absolutely, that's no news. That's why they will have easy game by uh, starting this one world religion means getting all the apostate churches, apostate of the Roman Catholic Church, that is, back under the wings of the Roman Catholic Church. And for that, I can um, point you to a video that I made uh, about um, the one world religion, the wound is healing. Um, where they speak about, uh, for example, Tony Palmer mentions in, uh, in the seminary of Kenneth Copeland, where they have this meeting with the Pope via iPhone, uh, where he states that, the, that there was made a treaty in 1999 between the Lutheran Worldwide Organization and the Roman Catholic Church, where they uh, crawl back, crawl back under the wings of the Roman Catholic Church. And they gave up their Protestantism by saying um, there is uh, salvation through faith alone to good works. Exactly uh, the words of Robert, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of the Sparmer guy, who is deceased, by the way, <coughs> in the meantime. So, but, um, Edward, do you have anything to contribute to the subject that we were talking about uh, this evening, about the characteristics of Antichrist? Well, uh, my thought is that Antichrist opposes all that which is Christ. 
yeah, that is the common explanation of the word and, 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 or antichrist means and, against Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and it's a spirit that manifests that but opposes. You, you are aware that uh, the uh, translation of the Greek word antichristo, meaning antichrist, is not only anti, meaning against, but it's also anti, meaning in the place of, right? Yeah. It, the antichrist tries to assert himself above uh, Christ. Right. As, as, the, as, before. as being the so-called authority of truth. So do you agree that uh, the papacy is the Antichrist or do you think it's something else? What? Do you agree that the papacy is the Antichrist or do you think it's something else? Well, it is, the thing is, it, is the papacy, I'll answer with the question, is the papacy following uh, the commandments of Christ or that which is opposite? No, I just asked you a plain question. I just want a plain answer, please. Well, I'm not 100% sure, honestly, but what I do know is Antichrist is that spirit. And, and state of mind that is in op- the state of mind that is in opposition to Christ, that 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 tries to challenge the position of, of Christ and and the truth. Well, Edward, if you are not sure, then I think that you haven't listened to the first eight characteristics of Antichrist that I read here in the broadcast last week and in this broadcast altogether, which. Absolutely, without any doubt, up to the first eight points that have been read by now, explains that the Antichrist is the papacy, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. Well, which was at which they were working in opposition to the true meaning of of Christ and his mission. Well, Edward, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist is the papacy. It has always been the papacy. There is no question about it at all. If you have any confusion about that, you haven't done serious research on the matter, have you? Well, the, the research, the things I learned is from Walt. Right, and Walt's whole, his, his whole yeah. website, is the Grand yeah. Design Exposed, is yeah. is about the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist being the papacy. Yeah. But I mean, what I do know, but I what I am aware that there's a spirit that is in opposition to Christ that and you get into discussions with people and there's a opposition and they try to it, it, it that spirit tries to assert its authority above what you know is the truth, and they try to set themselves. Are, are you are you trying are you are you trying to evade my question? Yes, yes. No, no, I'm not evading the question. Well, you said you haven't studied the subject enough. We are here uh, on the tenth broadcast of mine, where in every broadcast I'm quite sure I stated that the papacy is the antichrist. Yeah, I, I, Michael, I, I, agrees, I, Michael agrees on that, and everybody who has been on the program agrees with that. And I'm going to read to you now, going uh, going to point nine of the characteristics of antichrist, and you still say, well, well, there is a spirit that that is doing this and is doing that. So you are denying what we are trying to teach people when we when we go into scripture, when we go into the Bible and we analyze who could be the Antichrist based on knowledge that is given to us through the word of God. Yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not disputing what you're saying. I'm just saying that uh, I listen I listen to Walt and, and you know and he's saying he's giving the information about what has happened in history, and that the that the Pope and the papacy has actually been the root of the problem uh, in Christianity, and uh, suppressing freedom for the, for the spiritual freedom of the people, and everybody has to follow his directive, 
without people having the ability to sort out what the truth is themselves. You're, you're, in a roundabout way, you're saying that uh, you're not, you don't believe that uh, the the Antichrist in the Bible is talking about the papacy. That there's more to it than that. Well, it, 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 there could be more to it than just the po- the Pope. Uh, yeah. Well, see, this is the dilemma that uh, each of... If you see, that the thing is, is in the, the scriptures it says there has been many antichrists. Right, yeah. and, and there's been many popes. Many, many, many manifestations of that spirit. Every pope has been the antichrist. We have had more than a hundred popes since the invention of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, the thing is, what I, what I see the sign is the, the wars over religion that has manifested through these battles, okay. Who starts all these battles? Who's the organization that starts... Who, what organiz, okay, there, these are all religious wars that we witness. Yeah. Who, what religion is starting all these, these battles? Well, I guess like, they, what happened there, okay, we know in history what happened when Islam showed up and then, then they tried to take over the Christian areas and then the Pope had... Who, to, who created Islam? Hmm? What organization created Islam? Um, I, I'm not really up to date on that. That would be Rome. That would be the papacy. Really? Did you know, did you know that? No, I... Do you, wait, recognize, wait, do you realize wait, that they, they, they created the Islamic faith to deal with the Jews and the Christians in Northern Africa and the Middle East? Yeah. Yeah, they did. Well, let, me, let, let me tell you something, uh, something that comes to my mind. Um, but for, uh, three Masons uh, contact that I had one time, he told, uh, he discussed this thing about why is there such these oppositions in religious doctrines in religion. You know what he told me? He says, well, it, it was all uh, set up that way in order to create uh, that oppositional situation in order to get the people to change their 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 way of thinking you know in other words the old model um order out of chaos they they set it up intentionally that way who's they he was talking about well this is it was a, it was a uh, freemason that and told me that that order out of chaos that the the the, the, the oppositional aspects of religion is actually set up that way in order to make who's, change. Who's, who is they that created all this opposition? Uh, I think he I think he was referring to the, the, the secret societies. Okay. Can you name one? Well, he, he, I don't, I don't know. He didn't give me any details. I can name you one. Yeah, but well, you understand the concept. They eh? create clashes so that they can, so it, 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 it actually will make them surrender. Okay, Hegel. Who's Hegel? The Galian dialect that we talk about. You know, problem, reaction, solution, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Guess what? He did. Who was he? What was his background? Uh, Who was he? Familiar. What organization was he connected with? Okay, I, I'm not familiar with his name. Okay. It all goes. But everything goes back to Rome, my friend. Okay. Everything so, goes back to Rome. So, so, so basically, so Rome is creating a controlled opposition. Yes. Yeah, so you don't pay attention to who the true biblical and historical antichrist is. So while you chasing all these different rabbit holes and these different little theories that everybody else has, you're not spending any time in the Bible studying it, researching it, history, verifying it, to realize that the biblical historical Antichrist has always been Rome. Do you call yourself a Protestant? That I'm just I'm just sharing what I found out. 
Ah, okay, I'm just asking, what kind of religion, if I may call it that, uh, do you follow? Are you following the Protestant religion, or are you following Rome's religion? Would you call yourself a Protestant? I, I was raised Christian. Yeah, what does that mean? Roman Catholics also say that they are Christian. They are not. That, that means Protestant. That means Protestant. So what are you protesting? Okay, by the way, I know these are tough questions. We're not picking on you, but these are valid questions that, that were you should ask yourself. When you say from yourself that you are a Protestant, you have to protest something, because then it means that you are against something, because you protest. So what are you protesting when you call yourself a Protestant? Okay, well, just an easy, just easy question. Okay. Basically... In my background, I didn't get into uh, all this stuff about uh, being against the Pope and all that. It, I just well, none learned, of our background stuff from uh, different none of our backgrounds. Yeah. None of our backgrounds. I, I didn't. I didn't get involved in in that uh, focus. Uh, I just learned a lot of different things from different people, right? but I didn't really get, didn't get involved in all that that fight in my younger years. Well, Edward, it doesn't have to go into into fight or anything. I just ask you, what kind of religion do you uh, rely on? You say, uh, if anything, that's the way that I understood, I would call myself a Protestant. So when you call yourself a Protestant, you know you have to know what you're protesting against, because otherwise you are not a Protestant. Okay, well, the thing is... What, what, what are you protesting against when you are a Protestant? Because otherwise you can also follow uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Well, the thing, the thing is, is this answer the question, Edward? I, I, Edward, I Edward, I Edward, Edward, whoa! I didn't get involved Edward. in protesting against them. I worked focused on finding uh, workable solutions and, and things that are um, helpful. If you, if you, Edward, Edward, yes. Answer his question, or don't, if, or, I did, don't, I, don't, I, I don't, 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 don't. I don't want to have a, a, a childless, mindless argument about this. He asked you a question. What are you protesting against? And right now, it looks like you're protesting against us. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. That's what it looks like is happening here, my friend. You're protesting against us, and you are trying to be defi- dis- uh, divisive and trying to put doubt in this conversation. And I, he asked you a specific question. You said you're a Protestant, therefore you must be protesting against something. What are you protesting against? If you answer the question, you know, either I just say, hey, listen, I'm not protesting against anything. You know, say something. It's all just this, is this rationalization, trying my mental gymnastics that I see over and over and over again. Listen, you know, this, this, you, you got on here as a friend or you were saying you're a friend. You wanted to be part of this conversation. What are you up to? You up to derail this conversation? I mean, this is, this is, listen, this is, not, this is not up to debate about what we're talking about. Right. Well, okay. we don't have to debate. We don't know the show. We're not debating whether we think the Antichrist is or who are protest, who are protesting this. And we're not interested in having a debate with other people about this. Yeah, okay. I, I understand what the subject is about, but you ask, I understand what the subject is about, but the point is, is you asked me what I was protesting against, and I didn't get involved in protesting. So you're not, you're not against, protesting against yeah, anything? Because I didn't, when I was in my younger years, and I didn't understand a lot, a lot of the stuff I, about what those what the Pope is about. Okay, this is the tenets. Oh. This is the tenets of being a Protestant. Thing is, like by listening listen, to, I don't want to have an argument with you. Listen, I'm going to block you, I'm going to take you off. Learning. I'm going to block you, and I'm going to take you off. Oh, you don't okay. shut up right now. Okay. I mean it. Protestant is someone who recognizes who the Antichrist is and protests against it. If you do not know who that is, you are not a pro. Protestants, my friend. And, you know, I'm not going to have this argument. When I was a little kid, I didn't know better, and I don't know anything. You know what? None of us, when we were little kids or when we were young growing up, were taught this, period. 
We're not interested in your past. We're not interested in all that. I'm sorry if I sound like a jerk about this, but, you know, you the show has been laid out what it's about. Okay. The show, the show has been about the characteristics of the Antichrist. If okay. you're a Protestant, a true Protestant, you will recognize who the Antichrist is, and you will, you know, raise the awareness of who that is and not play mind games with people. Well, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, not interested in mind games. Listen, I am being forthright and honest about, uh, you asked me a question, so I gave you an answer. Okay, in my upbringing, I didn't... Uh, who was the Antichrist I, now? I did not get involved in all this stuff about protesting against the, the, the Pope. I, I just, we just, um, yeah, when I was going to church, we just, just focused on the Bible and worship and praise and, and fellowship and things like that. I, and, 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 what's your, what's your oh, point? Okay, folks, so what the point is, you asked me the question and I gave you an answer. I didn't get involved in protesting the, these things, okay? The thing is, is I have to learn about what things are about to decide whether I'm for or against it, okay? And I and I don't like getting involved in judging people I haven't met. Okay, so... Okay, and, and, and that's what I'm saying. You haven't, you haven't met the papacy, therefore you're not going to make a stance. Is that what you're saying? What I'm, no, okay. <laughs> I've never... I, I can't afford to go there. I'm saying... What I'm trying to say is... Are you still there? Yes, I am. I'm sorry for being rude. No, you are not rude. I'm I'm sorry for being a jerk. I was expecting that already 10 minutes ago. (laughs) But you know what? I mean, I thought, you know, this guy sounded like he was somebody that, uh, you know, understood where we're at and understood who you were. And, you know, I'm not... This is ridiculous. But I guess this is part of the journey that we go through. And I think think this was a very interesting experience and I think this will be even a better experience for people who will listen to the broadcast afterwards um, when they see that we just exposed an agent of Rome coming into our broadcast avoiding any clear answer to an absolute just and profound asked question when I ask somebody which religion he follows, and he answers he is a Protestant, he cannot answer what he is protesting, then he is a phony. And when maybe I am rude, but I'm going to call him out as being a phony. I'm sorry. When he says that he studies the work of Walt Stickel on the website, Grand Design Exposed, when he listens to our broadcast here, where we have today already have had the um, uh, explanation of three or four characteristics of the Antichrist and he still does not agree that the papacy is the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist then he is an agent of Rome and I don't have anything to add to that except that I have to say congrats for throwing him off the program, if you wouldn't have done it I would have done it well, I, I was. I, listen, I just want to let so you guys, everyone know on the show that I wasn't trying to be a jerk about it. No, no. I, I gave a, I. an honest. No, I, I was just asking a question. In, I was just asking, asking a legitimate question. If you are calling yourself a Protestant, what are you protesting? Protesting, and he couldn't answer that. He couldn't. Well, well, Paul, Paul, Paul is on. What's up, Paul? Well, I, I just like to make a comment. You know what we're fighting? The biggest thing we're fighting. It's the world. It's, it's, that's that's what I was going to say. Is we're fighting the word ignorance. And listen, I I have a lot of empathy for Edward because I grew up in a Lutheran church, and I didn't know what the word Protestant meant. The word Protestant is thrown around continually, and Edward is sincerely, he's honestly and sincerely doesn't know any history it's not his fault it wasn't Walt's fault it isn't your neighbor's fault 
I mean, they have literally, if you don't understand the past, you'll never understand what's going on today. And you can't even begin to look into the future. I mean, and so I have a lot of empathy. I mean, I think Edward really was honestly, he didn't have the answers because he doesn't know what a Protestant is. He doesn't know that the, that the, that the Reformation was built, was built. Every single one of the Reformers and what, what, and what, what accelerated the Reformation was the fact that when they realized who the, the Antichrist of the Bible is, and Daniel and Paul, and you see, people don't, people have this Bible. My question, my question to all of us, first of all, do you believe that Christ died and was resurrected? I think that's the key question. And, and if they say yes, then they need to go back to that Bible. Because that Bible is so clear on who the Antichrist is. And so I'm not getting, I'm not, I'm not against Edward because I was in the same boat. I have no clue. Well, can I say something here? Yes, go ahead. I'm not against Edward, otherwise I wouldn't have asked him to come to the program. But when he came into the program and I asked him what religion does he follow, And he said to me, even, that he studied, and that was his own words, that he was on your website and working on your website and studying your website and reading your website. And he cannot even answer in a normal-fashioned way who the Antichrist is. Then he is, and I don't like to say that, then he is, uh, whether absolutely ignorant to that fact, and that must be by, by, by knowledge, because you cannot be on your website studying what you have all put on there, exposing Rome, exposing the sun worship, exposing the bell worship, exposing um, the two kingdoms, and uh, Washington being the mirror of Rome, and all that stuff on your website, and all the links that you have on the left side on your website, to the Jesuits, and all that stuff and not giving a correct answer of who, to your opinion, is the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist. When you cannot do that, then you are just wasting your time. And when you're wasting your time, you are wasting our time on this broadcast. Sorry to to say it that clearly, but that's my opinion of this. I don't hold hold any grudge against Edward or any other person. But I think that when you are asking to be come, to to become a part of a program that uh, analyzes the char- characteristics of Antichrist, then you should be of a little bit of knowledge in that point. And uh, he is not 20 years anymore, so he has had time enough to study. And you know where I come from some years ago. And you know where you, where you yourself came from some years ago. And look at Michael where he came from some years ago. There is no excuse for that. Sorry. Well, it, 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 it is it is under, understand. I mean, uh, you know, a switch can come on to him. A switch, and what happens is when the switch turns on, all of this, in other words, you see, he thinks, he kept saying it was a spirit. It's a spirit, yeah. It is part of a spirit, Satan's spirit. But in other words, see, people don't want to come to the conclusion that there's an actual place here on earth where the, there, there is a, a blasphemy, the, 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 a nuclear blasphemy is being produced in Roman Catholicism because they don't, it's like myself, six years ago, and you see uh, Edwards has got bits and pieces of the puzzle, and he's still trying to reason this out. When you go into the, when you, these people that are in these churches today, when these, these people that are in the churches today, are, they, they, listen, they, they are ready to take your heads off. They are the, the inquisitors because they don't understand, because it's a lack of understanding. You see, and, and, and another, and another thing is once, 
it, I, I, this is a big question. It was, it, I, I think it was a good example for the, for the broadcast to show, you know, I don't think he, he was honestly, he is honestly deceived. He still hasn't understood who the Antichrist is. Well, I've ta- I mean, I've talked to men. Uh, give you an example is, 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 you know, when Paul D. came down here and visited me for four days. Been to a Bible college. He's been to a Bible college. He's written his own Bible. Yeah, and he tried to defend Pauli. I mean, okay, that, that started me already off on the wrong foot, you know, because so, you know what I think about Pauli after we had that. Well, uh, well, and Paul, Pauli's a good, but Paul, Paul, Pauli is a is a prime example. Now, it's been over a year since I experienced this. It took me over a year to realize where this man's head was. Yeah. I mean, in other words, in, in, in other words, I, I, cause I take everybody for face value and I try to get the best out of somebody. Uh-huh. But when somebody, when somebody like this, you have to under, and I, I'm just reading chapter 10 in uh, code word, Bob Barbalon. It's uh, it's on the Jesuits. It's called the Jesuit Bible's changing of the world. Mm-hmm. It, it, and I think it was even New York. What, when this man was to come to see me, there were several people said to me, well, Walt, why is this man coming down to see you all the way from Canada, 400 miles on a bus? <laughs> it, now, it took me over a year to realize just what this man is doing. He's a, he's a, he's, he, he, I mean, he's a, a one quarter away from graduating from a Bible college. He was raised in Pavaria. This like today when you were talking about the Pavarian Illuminati. Mm-hmm. He was raised in Pavaria. And every time you mention Pavaria Illuminati, we should always remember where the National Socialist Party came from. They didn't come from Berlin. Nope. They come from Pavaria. And exactly the, right. And, and, the, and you said another statement in the broadcast today. The, 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 the government of the National Socialist Party in Germany is still intact. They're still under the concordance of Rome. You see, you know, and, 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 and the, so, so when, you, when you think, it, it, it's, it's really to, to me now, and why did he pick me? How did he, he found me through, through Edward, you know? You know, but, but the thing of it is, God, I, God has taught me how how ignorant I've been, and, and I have had very little discernment. I mean, the discernment, I mean, this is what I'm going through here this last couple of months, brothers. I mean, I mean, this is, when you start actually seeing, like, it, it isn't up for debate. And yes, there's something very simple. You cannot say you're a Protestant and not know who you, you're protesting. Well, I was, when I went into the military, when I was 19 years old, I mean, I was a Protestant. I didn't know what I was protesting. I was ex- exactly like Edward. Exactly. I didn't know any history. Yeah, but excuse me, Walt. He is not 19 anymore. He has studied you. He has studied your website. He has studied a lot of things. He was listening to our broadcast. He is just ignorant of the fact. He just don't want to see it. He just don't want to acknowledge the things that he could have learned. And, and, and the problem is, too, I want to say, gentlemen, yeah. is that here we have a show specifically about the Antichrist, and what obviously had happened is that somebody wanted some attention, which is not a problem. Everyone wants attention. But it's inappropriate, it's disrespectful to come on to this show and just start, you know, throwing your own two cents in and going off into another direction when, you know, we're trying to read this, we're trying to um, teach people, you know, scripturally and historically, prophetically, who the Antichrist is. And if you really are in that position, this is not just Edward, it's for anybody. Even myself, when I was learning this stuff, I wasn't getting on shows and trying to get my get heard. I was trying to hear. And that's a really important principle. If you want to know the truth about anything, you've got to spend some time listening, thinking it through, understanding, analyzing it, 
to get to the point where you could, you know, maybe have a comment or two. To just come on this show and just say, you know, just to get on the show, just to be heard, you know, it's not just going to be Edward. It's going to be an awful lot of people that are going to go through this and the show. Uh, not because I'm better than anybody else, hardly at all. Do I have all the answers? I do not. I will never claim I have all the answers. But if someone's going to come on the show and start, you know, just being buddy buddy, I've seen this thousands of times now. In other shows, I've seen this in other people's lives where they have, you know, in their shows, like a Tom Fress or whoever it may be, you know, where, you know, they're trying to teach the truth, trying to share that with people. And you know what? It just gets derailed over and over and over and over again because people don't want to listen. They just want to be heard. And Edward's no different than anybody else. Yes. And until that time comes where he's humble enough to listen, I, what more can we do except share the message? And when all I'm asking is anybody who wants to get, you know, get on the show and start taking a 20 different directions, and if it doesn't come back to who the Antichrist is, the biblical, historical, prophetic Antichrist, it's not my opinion, it's not Walt Stickle's opinion, it's not anyone's opinion. It's no man's opinion. It's the biblical, historical, prophetic Antichrist. That means that all the evidence and weight, the weight of evidence, all points to one organization. Period. If anybody wants to go on all these different avenues and say it's a spirit or say, you know, make an excuse or this or that, or just want to talk about themselves, their personal lives, you know what? We can do that on Skype. We could do that in another show, but not on this show. But it is a good, it is a good example. It, this was an example of, of, of what goes on, what we're up, up against in the world, because right. the world has been trained not to listen. I mean, they, they, I mean, I mean, we, and this is, no. this is I a think, very, this I is a very subtle, to... subtle, go ahead. Yeah, I think we have to give him a little bit credit for his, for his intelligence. I think um, that was just... Uh, it's uh, not a tactic. It's why it's, it's try to, to uh, infiltrate this broadcast. That's the yes. way that I see it, and you cannot convince me of anything else. Because really? otherwise he would be as stupid as toasted bread, and I don't think that he is. No, <laughs> no way. That is well. That, in, in, was, that was that was controlled opposition going to try to interfere in this broadcast and try to take us away from the truth that we are spreading here. But I think it was a good test because I was listening a long time. And in, in other words, you you kept you both of you kept to the same question. I mean, and you asked simple questions. In other words, I mean, because because anybody's, I don't care. I, I'm very comfortable with somebody disagreeing. If they disagree, that's fine. Or they don't want to, you know. But in other words, you, 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 like I said, it was a perfect example of what we face in the world. And the Bible calls it, says the whole world will be deceived. Absolutely. And brother, this is, this is exactly what, it, what is happening in this world. By the way, I, I, I'm not, I hope, and I know it sounds like I'm showing a lack of empathy for a guy like Edward, and but I, I want you to know that it's not the case. No, and it has nothing because because this the issue is greater than Edward. It's greater than Mike Adams. It's greater than Walt Stickle or your Juggler sixty six. The issue is much greater than any of us in our personal, our, our, our whatever things you know the our feelings, our emotions, our thoughts, our opinions. It's much greater than that, and you know. Um, yeah, it was a very good example, and it's the irony of all the things that's been on this show. I mean, we have talked about some really tough issues, but this particular show and the reading of this particular article has brought out more <laughs> things than has ever in any other show as far as contention and confusion and arguments, and I don't know why that is. I uh, praise the Lord, it, you know, he works the way that he works, but it's a, a really irony because of things that we have talked about on this show, you would think there would be an old heck of a lot of, of 
people calling up and, and really going to town on us. But this particular show, this particular reading of this particular article, now two weeks straight now, has it's been... <laughs> Well, it's, 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 it's a it's a great it's a great article. I mean, it's not only not, not not only does it have text, but I haven't had a chance to look at the. There's a video for every one of these characteristics. Yeah, a lot so of it, these characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. Pictures, that, in the, in the pictures in the article also. Yeah, it, it it is a fan. I mean, after you get through the 28 characteristics, you've got to understand. But you know, I'll tell you, the bottom line is this. The bottom line is when people realize that it's biblical. We're talking Bible. We're, you know, and I, I can take you, you can go to the NIV. It's in verse 2, chapter, I can't, uh, uh, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin revealed the son of perdition. Now listen, if you go to the NIV, it's going to tell you a futurist. I just came across this yesterday. I just came, it it says in the NIV, it says, "Let, let, let no one, let no one deceive you. You know, and, and, and it goes on. It eliminates the man of sin. It's amazing what they have done with these Jesuit Bibles. Yeah, you know why Paul is writing his own Bible because it has to fit his agenda. Y- yes, and there's a- anybody that goes to that extreme, there is a spirit. There is a spirit. I don't know what yeah. I mean. But, and and, and not, I, we can be sure it's not the Holy Spirit. It's it's not the Holy Spirit. I mean, I, you know, but that's another that's another thing I just came across uh, that I that I just came across yesterday. I started doing a web page on this. You know, uh, if you go to Second Thessalonians, uh, in the NIV versus the King James, I mean, you will never see the Antichrist. I mean, it's amazing what they did. And, and listen, if you go to if, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, chapter two. The whole chapter is on the Antichrist. You know, and uh, and it's it's you know I it, it I got up yesterday mor- morning and I just and and then that's when I started this the Jesuit that's chapter ten and in, in um, code word Bar- Barbalon, the Angel in the Vatican by P D Stewart. You know, the Jesuit Bible's changing of the word. Because, see, all the, the bottom line is this. All the, the manuscripts of all these false Bibles come from Rome. That's where they, that, that's the dividing line. One more thing to prove that Rome, all roads lead to Rome. Oh. And by the way, you know what, going better on than Second Thessalonians, folks, Whoever at listens to this ever is will be revelations. If you actually honestly spend, uh, you're going to have to spend some time if you don't know much about it. And if you think you do, you're going to spend some more time. I've spent many a day trying to study this. I've come to realize that just about all of revelations is pointing to Rome. Of That's course. not, that's not my opinion. It's it's my opinion. It, it is to warn the people who come after Jesus Christ of the false teachings. The revelation of Jesus the Christ. The idea of revelation to warn the people and, 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 and that people can still find the way to Jesus when he is not here to minister. Starting with the Church of Pergamos all the way through, it is warning over and over again. It showed, not only, it's not only warning, but historically it's going, if you start now, let's start to study the seals and the bowls and the trumps and how they all relate to the past, not just today, folks, for the past 2,000 years. So Revelation is literally, if, if for un, understanding Revelations, you not only have to understand the symbology, but then you have to understand history. What have we been under for the past 2,000 years? What has God been actually been warning us about? And you're going to find, if you go with an open mind, not to be prove your point of view, but just to know the truth, God's truth, the truth, you're going to come to a starting realization that throughout the whole book, it is literally warning God's people about this, this system that comes out of Rome. 
you could even go further than that. You know, I, I, I've said this many times, but I borrowed a friend's Bible one time and he, in the New Testament. He had underlined every place in the Bible where it talked about false religion. And I'm telling you, 70% of the, of the New Testament of the, of the New Testament is on false religion. So, so, you know, when you read that New Testament, I mean, when it's, when it's talking about false religion, which one is the biggest in the world? Right. <laughs> and which yeah. one has control of the harlots? <laughs> or created the harlots. Are creating the harlots. It's the mother. The mother well, creates these... her daughters. Her daughters don't come out of just, you know, thin air. You know, she births these daughters. Yes, yes. Yes, I mean... We are now dwelling a little bit away from the actual subject of this broadcast, which is the characteristics of the Antichrist. So <laughs> well, I think it's going to be... Can, I can, can imagine what next show is going to be like. For whatever, for whatever reason, Satan has his eye on this show. We, yeah, <laughs> I, I, just, I just wanted to say that. I mean, today, and, and this is clear to me now, today, this was a test of the Holy Spirit. Can we stand the... Um, uh, deception can we stand the uh, how do you say that the temptation um, the temptation of being led away from the work that we are doing by adding a guest into the show that tries to spread false truths I want to talk um, about of all things like Freemasonry folks anybody listens to this once again Freemasonry, if you trust any man who's a Freemason, you better check you better check yourself again. You better check that twice or three times. And people will say, Well, you know, well, you know, these are honorable men. They kept they, they keep vows and then you know, they're honest and, and, and integral. You know what? There's nothing there's nothing honorable keeping a lie, holding on to a lie and deceiving the whole world. And just because a man's a Freemason doesn't mean that he's gonna tell you I'm gonna repect good chance because he's a Freemason, he's not going to tell you the truth at all. Because he doesn't know the truth. He doesn't know the truth and he has a different spirit running him. He's, he's you know, he's got the Luciferians teaching him, guiding him. I, you know what? It's good to know about Freemasonry, but if you don't understand who actually controls Freemasonry and what Freemasonry truly is about, you'll be spinning your wheels forever about Freemasonry. And if there's one person that can tell you about that, it would be Walt. Well, because Walt has spent many a year studying Freemasonry, and, and, it, and it's kind of ridiculous <laughs> when you when you come and you read all these books. When I was out in the truck, I read every book I could on Freemasonry. And when it comes to, when it comes right down to it, Freemasonry is set up just like the Roman Catholic Church. It has degrees. The people that come into the church and pay and pray do not know what's going on on the top. And the Freemasons that come into the Freemasonry, the Master Masons, that's the first three degrees, it's set up the same way. They have no idea what the top's doing. Well, Walt, um, let me interrupt you here. This is something that I mentioned on the last two broadcasts also, uh, something that Tom Frest mentioned in the last broadcast when he said that Freemasonry is the Protestant arm of the Jesuits. That is also why Roman Catholics are forbidden to join any Freemason lodge, of course. Wait, maybe, um, your, maybe I just, you, yeah. you should expand upon that, because, you know, after we just got through talking to this man, Edward, about what is a, a Protestant, and they, what's your protest, and then we hear that that's, you know, what is what do we mean by what you're saying? Because a lot of people are going to misunderstand what you're saying. Well, I can only say this. Um, the show today has shown uh, to our uh, listeners um, that we follow the right agenda, that we will expose anyone who is coming into this call and not being legit in the word of Christ. And it also shows that we have too little time to cover all the subjects that we could discuss for hours and hours and hours because even this conversation about Freemasonry and false spirits and false prophets and Antichrist could go on for days even. But we are limited. We are doing a broadcast 
And uh, I think that when we announce a broadcast and we're going about a certain subject, then we should keep to that subject. Uh, we have now the last hour diverted a little bit from that, but that's no problem in, in itself because that last hour was very um, uh, wrathful to me at least. But I think that we should at least cut the uh, recording down right now, continue next time with point nine of the uh, characteristics of the Antichrist, and we can, con we can continue uh, on, on, on Skype and, and uh, have our discussion here. But this is not something that we should uh, involve all the listeners in, also because this is maybe something then for another broadcast that we can use. And so um, I would rather say right. that we can bring this now to an, to an end. Um, I very much appreciate Walt Sticker coming into here and uh, giving his points also. And I want everybody, I want to advise everybody who listened to the show to go a little bit back and go back to the time when Edward came on and analyze what has been said on his side, what has been said on Michael's side, and what has been said on my side, and analyze that and measure that to the word that we were reading and measure that to the word of the Bible, to the word of God. Uh, I thank everybody who uh, called in and who uh, was participating in this call today and who listened to this call today and was listening to the call in the future. And uh, there surely will be many more calls, even though that I have now more time. Maybe we can even more do, do them more than one broadcast a week. Uh, I will see that with Michael. But for the moment, I thank you very much for being on the show today or listening to the show. And um, God bless you. And uh, until the next time, bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, York. And as far as my question goes, um, as far as what he meant by uh, the uh, that Freemasonry is the Protestant arm of the Jesuits. What has happened, folks, in a nutshell? I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time on it, but this is for all those who listen to us because it was a valid question, is that the Jesuits in Rome have infiltrated the Protestant movement through the seminaries and through the leadership of all these different Protestant religions, and they have Jesuits running the show at least in the top level, the hierarchical top level of the church. And they've been teaching all these men false doctrine like futurism and a whole bunch of false doctrine. So that's what we mean by it's now that the, the Freemasons are the Protestant arm of the Jesuits of Rome because they have taken over Protestantism from the top down through false doctrine and through uh, poisoning the leadership of all these different religions. And every single one of them is a, is, is a victim of that now. And uh, I hope you guys get, get a lot out of this. I mean, I tell you one thing: these 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 characteristics of uh, the Antichrist. If you do, you know, once again, it's remnant dot or remnant of God dot org, and you look under the book there, the PDF, and, the, and this uh, it's it's really a powerful short pamphlet, if you will, of information and. I imagine there's going to be, uh, if, it, if the way things go with this particular show, there's going to be a few, a few more moments like this. Anyways, uh, won't have be having a show tonight. Uh, we'll be having a show tomorrow night with James Japan or James Arnett from jamesjapan.net or jamesjpn.net. That show, that's always a fun show. And then uh, Sunday... We do having a conversation with Wake Us Up from Slumber. That 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 young man, he's doing some interesting work. He's got a lot of fire in his belly, and he's really out there to expose and the Antichrist to protest again and protest against a lot of these things that are going on there. So I'm looking forward to talking to him. And uh, with that, thank you, York. Thank you, Walt. Thank you, Edward. Thank you for all the other folks who uh, who listened or will listen. You know, it's. I know the tone of voice that you're hearing seems strong. It seems um, harsh at times because we're not used to it. Because we have men who are standing up for the truth. And, um, but, you know, I, I, we're in a day and age where we have to. We have to, we have to, get, we have to stay focused on the message as best as we can. We can certainly disagree on the details. There's nothing wrong with that. And makes it's a lot of logical. It, it makes sense. That's how we grow. 
But the big issues, who is our Lord and Savior? Who is the Antichrist? Uh, what are we supposed to be, you know, and who are we supposed to represent? And if we do represent the Lord, are we not supposed to expose the, the, the biblical historical antichrist? These are all things that the, most of us in this show agree with, and hopefully we can re- always remember that, that, even though we may differ about the, the, the details or the, some of the historical facts here or there or whatever, or how we see things, um, that's not the important issue. The important issue is who our God is, who our Lord and Savior is, who the, who's the enemy, what are we supposed to do? So with that, thank you, everyone. And uh, it's been a, it actually has been a good show. <laughs> it actually has been. So um, it's not the way I'm expecting it to turn out, but that's the way it is. So with that, I'm going to end the show, and uh, we'll move on to...